Chapter 47, Redheads Have Temper Triskelion, Washington, D.C. February 13, 2009, 0500H Local U3 Fury pointed to Carlson, Barton, and Romanoff. Come with me. He lifted the box of the podium and handed it over to Hill. I want you to burn that later. He said before walking out of the room, followed by the group. Fury walked across the hallways of the Triskelion and up the elevators until he reached his office. He inputted his biometric scan to open the door then walked in. When the door closed, he pressed the button for the blackout protocol on his desk. What do you know, Romanoff? Fury inquired with a hard glare. Too much. Natasha answered promptly. But too little about this. She continued. Explain. Fury ordered. Natasha took a second to formulate an acceptable and coherent answer. This is one of the downsides of dating Naruto. Fury knows she knows stuff, and that fact is bugging the hell out of him. There are times she thinks that Naruto dates her for the express purpose of pissing Fury. Let me start from the end boss and work my way back, because the first part would take over the whole conversation. Natasha said with a shake off her head. Just remembering the whole sorcerer incident is stressing the fuck out of her. We just got into bed at around 3 a.m., when Naruto said something about Tony being in trouble before leaving. She continued. 3 a.m. What the hell are you doing up at 3 a.m. when you're on vacation? Clint asked, but an idea came to his mind, and he suddenly backtracked. You know what? I don't want to know. He asserted. Get your mind off the gutter, Clint. Natasha scolded before adopt adopting a mischievous and sultry grin. We finished at 12. I need my rest, you know. She added. Clint tried to cover ears as he doesn't want to hear the sex life of someone he considers a sister, but he's just too slow. Phil remained stoic as ever with his patented smile, but Natasha could make out a little pink dusting on his cheeks. Ahem. Fury cleared his throat to get everyone's attention. Moving on. Any guesses how he knew and what he could he have done after he left? Either he has someone looking over Stark or... Natasha replied while pulling out a Horatian Kanai. He has something like this and was able to call for Naruto. She replaced the Kanai to her holster. Ever since Natasha figured out what those knives do, she never went anywhere without it. As for what he did after he left. I have no idea. He might have rescued him, or just went to get some intel. When he came back an hour ago, I just had him bring me here. Then he went again. She finished. Fury rubbed his forehead. The one thing he hates the most is being left in the dark, and Naruto is a fucking black hole. He typed into his computer until he found what he's looking for and turned the screen towards the audience revealing Frank Castle's military picture. How about him? Do you know anything about why one of the best Force Recon is doing undercover bodyguard work for Stark? Fury asked with a raised eyebrow. Either Stark knew there's a threat to his life, and hired the best guy he could find, or somebody knew he's in trouble, and sent the same guy. Either way, Naruto is more than likely involved. Natasha answered with confidence. Fury thought what they should do next for a few moments. With Naruto taking point, the whole situation would be resolved I. Qu quickly but sitting back is not an option. My orders remain the same. I don't want Peggy Carter to rise from the grave, because we didn't do anything to save his godson. Natasha almost went into a coughing fit hearing Fury talk about the exaggeration of Peggy Carter's demise. Now. We're done talking about the Stark fiasco, let's circle back to what you say is the first part of your story. He suggested. 
Ah, uh, right. That one. Natasha let out, dreading the headache the following conversation would cause. I really don't want to report about this, but this is something you should know, boss. She said, giving everyone her thoughts about the topic. Just spit it out, Romanoff. Fury exclaimed, wanting to get the conversation over with. Natasha took a deep breath and started. We were sleeping on our bed at around 2.30, when I woke up to a feeling of someone watching us. I reached for the knife under my bed and started to look around. That's when I saw two people standing at the foot of the bed, an African-American man and a bald European woman. I threw my knives at them, but it just bounced off after they created circular sparking shields. Another one of Naruto's weird friends? Clint asked. That's what I thought so too, so I woke Naruto up. After a struggle to get him out of bed, I finally managed to get them out of the room, but I eventually followed them to the living room. They introduced themselves as Carl Morto and the Ancient One. Natasha said. Fury immediately turned the screen back to him typed in the name Carl Morto, searching their databases for it. Carl Morto. Says here that the guy died 18 years ago. Fury turned the screen around towards the group. Is this him? He asked. Yeah. Exactly that. He hasn't aged a day. Natasha commented as he's looking at the picture. What else did they say? Fury asked. There's only one message. Don't save Tony Stark. Natasha said with a serious look. Of course, he didn't take it well, so he led me back to the bedroom. Before we got inside, though, Mordo released some kind of rope to grab on Naruto's arm. He told me to get in the room, and everything after that is just a secondhand story from Naruto. He said that they brought him to another dimension and tried to trap him, but of course, it didn't work. She finished with a shrug. Can you give me a summary of this, because it looks like you're saying magic is real. Clint requested sarcastically while cleaning his ear. Sorcerers visited Naruto to stop him from saving Tony Stark, since they said that the fate of the universe depended on it. Natasha summarized. Fury walked back to his chair and flopped down. I missed it when the most amazing thing the world has ever seen is a man that could lift five times his body weight. Fury commented before looking back at Natasha. Any idea how to find them? Natasha thought back on every detail she got from the short meeting. Examining it frame by frame, scene by scene until she could give something usable. Only one thing stood out, boss. They're wearing robes with an Asian influence. If it were me searching, I'd start looking anywhere in South or East Asia. Natasha suggested. That's a huge range. Fury commented. Good thing I'm not the one going to look for it. Natasha replied with a smug smile. Stark's Mansion, Malibu, Los Angeles. February 13th, 2009, 0730 H Local. Naruto left the Triskelion in the middle of Fury's talk and decided just to sleep back in New York. He woke up a little earlier than the agreed time of his return, but decided just to go to LA anyway, and it's one of the best choices he ever made. When he got to Tony's underground garage, he saw Pepper berating Tony at the other side of the hollow table while Ensign and Frank are sitting at a table at the other side of the room, enjoying the show. He walked over towards the audience and pulled up a sit. Did I miss anything? Naruto whispered while still looking at the couple. Not much. She just got here three minutes ago. Frank answered while drinking his beer. What happened anyway? Naruto asked. Tony's chair force buddy. Frank started. Rody. Naruto interjected. Yeah. Rody. He called Stark's girl over there that we've been napped. 
The computer voice thingy. Jarvis. Naruto interjected again. Yeah. That. Alerted the redhead that we're here. So the girl ran down here and started to dress the living shit out of Stark. Frank finished, causing Insen and Naruto to snicker. Naruto then focused on Pepper berating Tony, thoroughly enjoying the show. I mean, how could you not tell me? You have a hole in your chest with a car battery sticking out of it. Isn't that enough to wake me up? You at least could have called Rhodey. I almost had a heart attack. Pepper shouted in a tirade, her face red with anger. I was going to tell you when you woke up. I didn't know you were going to wake up because of Rhodey's call. Tony defended until he noticed Naruto at the edge of his sight. Besides, Naruto needs to bring us back. He said, redirecting Pepper's ire towards Naruto, giving him a breather. What? Pepper shouted before turning her head towards Naruto. Shit. Naruto shouted, but Pepper is already heading towards him. He had to step back at the intensity of Pepper's glare. Frank and Insen made a tactical retreat. Why do you need to bring them back? Pepper shouted. Um. 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 Naruto let out, not able to form coherent sentences. Spit it out. Pepper shouted again, making Naruto jump six feet into the air. Because he still needs to be rescued. Naruto finally replied. He's already here, right? It means he's already rescued. Pepper reasoned. By me? Nobody knows about me. Naruto replied, but Pepper only, only flashed a confused look. Come on, Peps. Don't tell me you aren't even a little bit suspicious, right? Of course, Pepper was suspicious. The whole Naruto enigma is suspicious. He just gets in and out everywhere he goes, knows too much, and the entire endless pocket thing trick he does. She reasoned with herself that Naruto is some kind of super agent sent by a government agency to protect the family since the Starks is one of the backbones of America's economy. It kind of works out too since when Naruto and Tony first met, they took down a crime syndicate that's operating within their casino. The next time he comes back was a few months after Morgan. Pepper thought that the government wanted to help them keep Morgan safe. Naruto's help with rooting out spies supported her theory. Add the fact that Naruto is also dating some kind of super spy based on his stories, and it's practically a locked-in answer. You're a spy, right? Pepper blurted out, mirroring her thoughts. Fuck no. Naruto exclaimed. Except for my Haim, of course. He automatically added before he shook his head to focus back on the conversation. Getting back on track. I'm not a spy. I'm just a guy on vacation forever. Ask Frank over there. He said while pointing at Castle. I met him while on vacation in Afghanistan. Frank had to shake his head, remembering that particular conversation. He had a fucking migraine after it. Sir, the fabrication is done. Both items are ready to come up. Jarvis said, putting an end on Pepper's warpath. Go ahead, Jarvis. Put up the reactor first. Tony replied before looking towards Ensign. Come on. You helped build it. You'll help to place it in. He said as he walks towards the floor space, which suddenly opened. You realize I'm not that kind of doctor, don't you? Insen retorted, but he still walked over towards Tony. He stopped in his tracks, though, when he saw the glowing blue cylinder rising on the podium. See this. This is the future. Tony boasted while picking up the miniature arc reactor and walking towards the reclining chair. Insen followed Stark, 
excited with the opportunity to hold something like the arc reactor. What are they going to do? Pepper asked, nervous after getting the first real look at the electromagnet in Tony's chest even at a distance. He's going to change the magnet to something more portable and powerful. He needs more juice for the next part of his plan. Naruto answered. What next plan? Pepper asked again. Now that, that's a surprise. You don't have to wait long, though, since they're almost done. Naruto replied while pointing Tony standing up from the chair. Pepper finally saw the real size of the electromagnet, and it's a lot larger than she thought. Jarvis, you can pull up the next one. Tony ordered. Of course, sir. Jarvis replied. A large panel on the floor opened. Slowly, the group can finally see what Project Knight is all about. A hulking behemoth of metallic gray armor made of thick panels of steel and hydraulics. They can see guns and canisters placed around the suit. Tony walked over to the suit of armor and inspected it all around. A lot cruder than what I would like, but what can you do in six hours? Tony commented with a shrug. Tony. What's that? Pepper shouted. This would make sure that we make out of the cave hole. Tony replied while pushing a button on the side, and the front armor lifted. He then walked to the inside of the armor and closed the panel. What are you doing? Pepper asked. Tony releases a breath of exasperation. He understands that Pepper is asking all these questions out of worry, but this is all too much. I'm going to wear this, and we're going to walk out of the cave. Frank would be right behind me, shooting at everything not friendly while Enson would hang back. Tony laid out their plan, so Pepper knows what they would do and can calm down a little. The suit started up, enabling Stark to move around. He walked towards Pepper, who's holding in her tears. Don't worry, Peps. This thing. He said while tapping his chest. Can stop half a case of 50 calories machine gun rounds. It'll hurt for sure, but I'll be alright. He placated. Pepper gave a small nod and tried to hug Tony, but the armor made it a hard task. So Tony lifted his helmet and leaned a little, giving Pepper a kiss. Tony separated from Pepper and moved towards the blank wall and removed his gloves. He placed his palm on the corner and it split open. I thought you got rid of that. Pepper stated in a slightly cold tone. Good thing I didn't, right? Tony retorted cheekily before turning towards Frank and Enson. Take your pick. The more, the better. He said. Frank walked towards the wall and scanned it. He started pulling down guns, knives, and mags. He handed over an Uzi and a handgun towards Enson when he got closer. We need a bag. Food and water as well. We might wander around the desert for a while before a rescue team could find us. Frank suggested while checking over the guns. I got your back. Naruto replied from the sidelines. He reached for his back with both hands and took out three duffel bags with the left hand and three military backpacks with another. He tossed all of it on the floor with the packs sounding full. Enson walked over to the bag and opened it, revealing an assortment of crackers, MREs and emergency water. The duffel bag is for anything else you might need. Naruto added before reaching behind him again. I forgot that I got this too. Showing them three special forces grade bulletproof vest. Just save the last one for Tony after all the chaos. Frank stood up from his spot and took a duffel bag and two vests, leaving the last one for Insen and giving Naruto a grateful nod when he stood up. He placed a vest in the bag and extra guns. Insen put on the vest and took two backpacks, placing one at the front and another at the back. He did this since Tony would not be able to carry the bag while in the suit, and Frank is is already carrying the duffel bag. 
The backpacks would hinder his maneuverability, but it's better to be him than Frank. Frank finished packing up and looked towards Einson. When he saw Einson packed up, he turned towards Tony and nodded, indicating that they're ready. Tony walked over to Pepper and leaned down a little. We'll be back in three days to a week. Don't worry, Pep. I'll come back. Tony said before kissing her again. He then walked towards Frank and Einson. Don't worry, Pepper. I'll watch over them. If they're not found in a week, I'll lead Rody to where they are. Naruto reassured Pepper as he hugged her. Naruto walked over towards the trio and reached behind him again and pulled out three Horatian Kanai. Take one. Naruto ordered. Tony, Frank, and Inson took one each but giving it a skeptical look. Keep that on you at all times. If there are any emergencies, just throw it to the ground or to where the crisis is. The trio pocketed the knife to wherever they can place it. At the bottom of the backpacks are red tags. Pull it right before you get rescued. It would burn the whole thing, making sure that nothing points towards me. Understand? Tony and Einson immediately nodded, but Frank needs to get one last word in. Geez. You're more paranoid than some spooks. Frank commented. Naruto let out a small grunt before grabbing the straps of the bag of Frank and Einson while placing his palm on Naruto's armor. Give them hell, eh? Naruto said before the whole group disappeared, leaving a dumbfounded Pepper. Pepper stood there for quite a while, staring at where the group was standing before she was snapped out of her stupor. Ma'am. Morgan is finally awake. Jarvis reported. Pepper shook her head and walked out of the garage, silently, silently praying for everyone's safety. Chapter 48, Breaking Out Kamar Taj, Kathmandu, Nepal February 13, 2009, 12.45 H Local Mordo Is everyone else okay? The Ancient One asks as Mordo walked towards her. It's a weird feeling for her, asking the well-being of her disciples. The brief contact they had with the fox was enough to blur their immediate future, making her blind even with the use of an infinity stone. Yes, Ancient One. Mordo replied with a small bow. No more additional casualties. I was the last one to leave. He continued. I also sent a few masters to retrieve the bodies, or at least as much as they can get without alerting the fox. Thank you. The Ancient One replied. Mordo accepted his master's gratitude. The pair stood over the balcony overlooking the training fields, where the sorcerers are calming themselves down. Seeing your colleagues ripped apart with the real threat of following the same fate is enough to stress anyone out. Especially the apprentices who have never experienced real-life combat. Mordo was looking at the sorcerer's shaken expression when he decided to break the silence and asked the question that's been bugging him ever since the mirror dimension. Can we fight him? Mordo asked in a silent whisper. Of course, we can fight him. The Ancient One replied. But that's not the right question to ask. She added. Can we win? Mordo amended his question. I'm not sure. The Ancient One confessed. There are just too many unknowns about him, but from what I saw, we would need an, an army of masters specializing in detection and combat to have a winning chance. She explained. Mordo had to agree with his master's assessment. Their whole encounter with the fox was just a series of surprises and fuck-ups. He's sure that the Ancient One noticed that the fox was only playing them evident by his calm demeanor throughout the whole confrontation. We should have marked the location of their apartment. Mordo let out. They only found the fox by a group of five eldest masters sending their consciousness to the newly opened chakra network and finding anything that's out of place. A dangerous venture that cost them the lives of four of the masters that turned to stone, but the radical idea bore fruit. 
the last one was able to find an anomaly. A self-contained source of chakra that has emissions barely, but its presence alone was enough to distort the natural chakra network around it, just like a black hole. A massive invisible force of nature that alters the space around it. The master was able to open a portal to the fox's location before his limbs turn into stone. Too bad they didn't try to find out where the exact location was geographical. All they know was that it's somewhere in New York. And with the knowledge of the fox with runes, they might be able to find him like that again. We can't do much about what happened in the past. We can only prepare for the future. The ancient one advised before a novice recruit came running towards them. The novice gave them a bow of respect before reporting. The masters that just came back from the mirror dimension wanted to report something. The novice reported. The Ancient One and Mordo looked at each other with worry. They wouldn't call for the Sorcerer Supreme without a significant reason. It is more concerning if it has something to do with the bodies of the sorcerers. Tell them that we would be right by. The Ancient One ordered. The novice bowed again before leaving. She released a sigh sigh and looked towards Mordo. Let's go. I want to finish to know what could be worse than having somebody ripped apart. She said before starting to walk to the hospital wing. Mordo followed behind the ancient one while calming himself down using one of Kamartaj's breathing techniques. His mind was running to different scenarios of what could have happened with the apprentices and masters. When they finally entered the morgue, he counted 27 tables with bodies covered with mystical white fabrics that would preserve the body as long as it's covering their body. The Ancient One walked towards the masters with Mordo following close behind. Is this everyone? The Ancient One asked, referring to the bodies. As far as we can tell, yes. A master answered for the group. We counted 22 apprentices and 5 masters. We have retrieved most of their bodies, but some parts just can't be recovered like most of the abdomen for some of them. He explained. At least we can give them a proper burial. The ancient one said with a sad voice. What did you want to tell me about the bodies? She asked, wanting to get to the point of the conversation. The master had to open rubbed his forehead, dreading the conversation. He extended his arms behind him to one of the other masters, which promptly handed him a sack bag. We took this bag to gather all the valuables they might have. The master explained while handing it over to the Ancient One. The Ancient One took the bag and opened it, seeing that there's nothing inside. This is empty. The Ancient One retorted, thinking why would they give the bag to her until she realized a crucial detail, and looked at her hand and the other masters. Where are their sling rings? She asked in a whisper. They have nothing on them except for their clothes. The master replied, already knowing how dire is the situation. Is there any sign of the fox still in the mirror dimension? The ancient one inquired. No, but we're not looking for him since we want to keep some distance from him. The master explained which the ancient one understood and supported. We must assume that he can get out of the mirror dimension in the future if he's not out already. The Ancient One stated. The group was silent, contemplating the disaster if the fox could bounce around the world. The cunningness and the skill of the fox are extremely worrying already. We need to make sure that the next timeline nexus must happen. The Ancient One asserted. What is the next event? Mordo asked from the sidelines. We need to make sure the sleeping soldier wakes up. The Ancient One replied. Captain America needs to be found. Stark Industries Main Office, New York. February 13, 2009, 0900 H Local. Obadiah Stane. The business mogul and a father figure of Tony Stark. He's a 6 feet 1 inch, blue-eyed, 65-year-old man who has one of the best business-oriented minds in the world. He was a friend and rival of Howard Stark, Tony's father. 
They met each other through Maria Stark, who Stain once stated. When the Starks died in a car accident in 1991, Stain stepped up and held the company together until the golden child, Tony Stark, can take over the company again. Stain was pushed to the sidelines and later became a business partner to Tony's growing company. Of course, he didn't like that he was now only receiving scraps from the multi-billion dollar company, but he didn't become known as a business mogul for not thinking stuff through. He waited for his time, making connections, and preparing moves for the future. The first thing Stain did was to build up his war chest for an eventual takeover. Good thing he has the perfect way to do it. Being in the weapons manufacturing industry, it's easy to find people people with less than stellar reputations. Stain started fudging data to give some buyers more than they bargained for as long as he was given a cut. This side business snowballed into a highly profitable business that caters to the lowest of the low, corrupt governments, tyrants, and terrorist groups. The moment Stain has enough money to raise his stock share from 10% to 51% to have a majority share, he enacted the second stage of his plan, removing Tony Stark and he has the perfect opportunity to do it, Tony's trip to Afghanistan. He only heard about it through the grapevine since Stark has been weirdly keeping a distance from almost everyone for at least three years, even him. He has never placed a foot on the Stark mansion in Los Angeles at the same time frame. Stain called Raza Hamid me al Wazir, or simply Raza. A 5 feet 9 inches, 40-year-old, an Afghan man, who also happens to be the general of the Ten Rings, one of the most vicious terrorist cells. Their job, kill Tony Stark. He made some moves to make sure Tony is in the best possible situation for an ambush, but it seems it didn't work out since they captured Tony Stark and some guy he didn't know about. Raza started extorting him for more money when they found out how valuable was the target. Stain was debating with himself if he should just pay or get rid of Raza to tie loose ends. The choice seems to be clear, but there seems to be a more problematic development. What do you mean he got away? Stain shouted to his three-level encryption phone. I didn't say he got away. I said he disappeared. Raza replied. A few hours ago, the camera feed from Stark's jail cell failed prompting the guards to call him over. He ordered his men to enter the room to check out what's the problem, but no matter how much they push through, they can't get in. It took them almost ten minutes to push through the door, which suddenly lost all its resistance. When they got in, no one was inside. Of course, he tried to find them, but to no avail. That's the same thing. I thought you are at least a competent, but it seems you're as useless as the rest of them. Stain shouted. He would have continued with his tirade if his secretary's voice didn't blare through the speakerphone. Mr. Stain. Your nine o'clock has arrived. The secretary said. Stain rubbed his forehead to settle down the headache that's forming. Fix your fucking mess, Raza. Kill him, and I'll double the deal. Stain ordered. Triple. Raza replied. Fucking terrorists. Stain said to himself. Just do it. He said before ending the call. Stain took a calming breath and pushed a button on the phone. Send them in. Stain said to his secretary. A few seconds later, an unassuming man in a suit walked into Stain's office. The man walked towards him and extended his hand. Good morning, Mr. Stain. I'm Agent Carlson from S.H.I.E.L.D. Phil introduced himself. Stain hid his momentary panic. An agent coming to him is never a good sign if Tony's kidnapping happened just a few hours ago, but he played it cool. Still, Phil Carlson recognized the panic. Stain held on to Phil's hand and shook it. Shield? Never heard of it. Stain replied genuinely before releasing Phil's hand. That's the way we like it. Phil replied with a smile before adopting a more professional look. I'm here to determine the possibility of Mr. Stark to cut a deal with his kidnappers to save himself. 
Stan walked over to the liquor table and poured himself a drink. Have you already been informed that Mr. Stark has been kidnapped? Coulson continued when Stain remained silent. Stain swirled his drink, taking a moment to formulate his answer. Tony is a one-of-a-kind man. A mind that comes only once every century. Nobody can deny that. Stain drank a swig from his glass. But there's something that comes with that, a stubbornness no one can match, and an ungodly amount of skill to piss someone off. He added, unconsciously channeling his frustration about Tony's disappearing act. So I'm saying it right here and now. There's no fucking way Tony would betray his country. He finished. Phil stood there for a moment, studying Stain's words and nuances. That's all I needed to hear. Phil said while pulling out a calling card from his inner jacket pocket. You can call me using this number if you have anything else to say. He continued while handed over the calling card. I'll leave you to your business, Mr. Stain. Thank you for your time. He said before walking out of the office. Stain looked over the card before drinking everything in his glass with one shot. Phil, on the other hand, started dialing a number on his phone. He waited for someone to answer before starting to talk. Stain knows something. Northern Afghanistan. February 13, 2009, 1930H local. The group appeared at the only blind spot in the room from the CCTVs, although it's a tight fit, especially with Tony in his armor. Naruto grabbed Tony's helmet and pulled him closer. Remember. Show them no mercy because they will show you none of it. They would rather kill you than exposing themselves. Naruto said while staring straight into Tony's eyes. If you want to marry Pepper in the future, which I say you're crazy if you're not planning on it, and get home to Morgan, you need to push your emotions aside temporarily and deal with all that crap later. You get me? He finished. Tony internalized everything Naruto just said. He acknowledges and agrees with everything, but it's never easy to make a soldier out of a man. It took him quite a while before Naruto noticed that Tony is finally in the correct mindset to do it. I'll be waiting outside maybe a kilometer away, so go wild. N Naruto said before disappearing. Tony checked his gear, which Frank and Inson followed. Why didn't Naruto just give us the gear after we busted out of here? Inson asked. He's been thinking about it since right before they left Tony's garage. Inson's question stopped Frank's checking out his gear. Motherfucker. Frank let out, which caused Tony to chuckle. Come on. We still need to bust out of here. Tony said, getting the group's attention into focus. He worked his way in front of them. They are now starting to hear shouting coming from outside the door. Somebody probably saw the massive armor suddenly appearing inside the cell. Ready? He asked. I'm just waiting for your sorry ass. Frank replied from behind the Tony while simultaneously cocking his rifle. I'm good. Insen answered. All right. Let's wreck us some terrorists. Tony declared before marching a few feet in front of the door while keeping a little bit of the side. Frank moved forward and planted a few charges around the door. He walked behind Tony again, waiting for the perfect time to blow it. The vault-style door handle started to turn, and Frank knew this was the ideal time. He pushed a button, and colossal explosion propelled the door outward, immediately taking out a few terrorists at the other side. Tony marched forward while keeping his arms aimed and swiveling around, looking for any threat that might suddenly show up at the corner. He stepped over the bodies while resisting the urge to look down. He can feel the slippery wet floor with some steps feeling more squishy than the others. When Tony reached the down door, he has no choice but to look down so he could step over it. But it quickly became apparent, apparent that it's a bad idea. He saw a man with multiple contusions to his face. It was all deep enough that he could see the skull. 
He could also see a semi-solid gel flowing out of a deep crack by the side of his head. Frank saw Tony slightly panicking, so he started knocking on his armor. Keep it together now. Panic later. Frank said with authority. Trying to keep Tony's focus on the task at hand. It worked though, since Tony started walking forward again. As soon as they turned the corner, Tony was immediately assaulted by a rain of gunfire. He started firing the machine gun on his arm towards the group with Frank shooting too while using him as cover. Enson stayed behind the corner. The terrorists didn't even stand a chance with the Tony and Frank combo. The pair mowed down everyone they come across with Enson lagging, making sure that the duo didn't miss anyone. The trio moved in that formation until they reached a large cavern with multiple corridors. A large group formed a firing squad with a few of them carrying machine guns. As soon as Tony went into the firing squad's view, the team opened fire at them. Tony had to backtrack against the hail of bullets. Fucking hell. Tony exclaimed. He's not sure if his armor could handle all of it. Frank gave their group a fighting chance with his quick thinking when he tossed two flashbangs toward the firing squad. When the gunfire stopped, Tony rushed forward and gunned down the team while simultaneously using the flamethrower. Tony something at the corner of his eye, which caused him to be alarmed. RPG. Tony shouted. Frank made a quick turn and shot down the man with the RPG. Tony's flamethrower caused it to blow up caving in some corridors. The corridor to the left. Go. Go. Frank shouted, pointing Tony to where they should head next. As the group moves out of the cave, Enson had to use his gun a few times to shoot at some enemies they missed during their first run through. Tony could finally see the exit, and he was surprised by what he saw. He saw. Aside from another firing squad set up around the cave opening, he also recognized several different size cases marked with his company's logo. Like the last time, the firing squad opened fire at them, but Tony didn't back down this time. He let the armor absorb the abuse with Frank occasionally shooting down men with RPG or grenades. Our turn. Tony said with an excited tone before he emptied his guns and flamethrower ammo. Making sure every weapon from his company is burned or destroyed. Frank followed Tony's example and opened fire on everyone while letting occasionally tossing grenades and C4 packs to the weapon cache. By the end of it all, the open space in front of the cave is flames, bodies, and craters. Tony's group walked around the fires and started walking towards the open desert. Frank took the lead, followed by Enzen and finally, Tony. This setup is used so that if anyone coming after them would aim at the armored man first before anyone else. Tony couldn't resist but turn around when they're quite some distance away and saw a mesmerizing sight. Tall flames are rising up high, illuminating the nighttime sky. That's just one of them. Tony said to himself, thinking how much Stark Industries' weapons are in the hands of other groups like this. Chapter 49 The Cavalry No More Northern Afghanistan February 13, 2009, 2015H Local We need to stop. Tony shouted. The suit's already out of commission. The suit should only have lasted for 10 minutes of rigorous use. So Tony was surprised by how long the armor had held up. He started to unfasten the armor from his body before raising the front panel and walking out of it. You're not just going to leave it, are you? Enson asked while handing over the extra backpack to him. Tony took the bag and put it on, making sure he strapped everything securely. Securely. Yeah, but we can't carry the whole thing. Besides, it'll just be a pile of metal scraps when I'm done with it. Tony replied with a grin. Frank was scanning the area with his gun sight, using the moonlight to look for any trackers. He was also looking for anything that they might be able to use to set up camp. He knows that the people he's with aren't exactly fit for a night-long trek. 
Hey, Frank. We have ten minutes to get as far away from here as possible. Tony shouted after flipping some buttons inside the armor. Frank, Einson, and Tony started jogging away from the freestanding armor. What the hell did you do? Frank asked. I'm getting rid of it. Tony replied, a little out of breath. The desert terrain is sapping his energy away. Did you install bombs in it? Frank shouted, realizing it's the only way anyone could get rid get of something like that so quickly. Maybe? Tony answered a little sheepishly. Are you crazy? We were getting shot at, and you had a bomb inside of the armor. Frank retorted, questioning how intelligent the Stark really is. Hey. If the suit exploded, it meant I would have died either way since it couldn't handle the punishment. Tony defended. Frank had to accept Tony's logic. If the explosive really is inside the armor, a bullet could only set it off if the suit had already been pierced. Hey. You're going to want to see this. Tony shouted before turning around. He had been counting down ever since they started jogging away, and the suit was twenty seconds away from blowing. Frank and Enson stopped in their tracks and turned around. Just in time too, since a few seconds after they turned back, they saw something launching high up into the sky. When it reached a few hundred feet, the whole thing exploded, temporarily illuminating the night sky with a big ball of fire. You attached a rocket to it. Einson retorted, still catching his breath. Oh yeah. You've got to attach a rocket to everything you can. It's like being a genius and billionaire 101. Tony retorted, retorted with a serious expression. Seeing Einson's are you serious? Reaction almost broke his resolve and released a laugh. He finally understood why Naruto continuously messes with everyone. Frank was looking at the dying down flames in the sky when he figured out what Tony's aim was. Ha! You made a flare on steroids. Frank commented with slight amusement. Got it, didn't you? Now the rescue team will know our general direction. We just need to get ahead of every other terrorist near here. Tony thought about his reply before realizing a fucking colossal flaw. We need to move around. Fuck. Didn't think of that. Don't worry about that for now. It's easier to deal with one or two guys looking for us than being stranded in the desert for seven days. Frank replied while checking over the remaining ammo inside the duffel bag. Come on. We still need to set up camp. He suggested. Yup, that's probably a good idea. A voice suddenly answered out of nowhere, which prompted Frank and Einson to aim their guns at the voice's direction. Whoa. Whoa. Easy. It's me. The voice continued as Naruto walked out of the darkness. Fucking hell. We almost shot you. Frank let out while lowering his gun. Eh. I'll live. Naruto said listlessly with a wave of his hand, dismissing Frank's statement. Where were you? I thought you'd meet us when we got out of there. Tony asked. I just cleaned up what you left behind. Naruto answered. I blew up some huge cache inside the cave, practically leveled the whole mountain above it. He chuckled, remembering the whole thing. Blowing stuff up certainly soothes the soul. I tried finding the head honcho of the group, trying to find out who orchestrated the entire thing, but I didn't find the guy there. So he might be in some other place being an asshole. He found him, of course, but he didn't take him out yet. Raza would be his bait to find the head asshole. The three-layer encryption made by Stark for mid- to high-level employees is just too strong for his mediocre skills, Compared to Tony, of course. Roz is not there? Einson asked with skepticism. As far as I can tell, there were no bald terrorists there. I'll have to piece some parts together just to make sure. Naruto lied. 
He didn't have to do the last part, but he just wanted to say it. His answer gave him the desired reaction, though. Why do I let Morgan near you again? Tony asked, partially recognizing the fact that Naruto is a dangerous and probably unstable individual. You have a kid? I know I'm not updated with the news, but I'm reasonably sure the higher-ups would at least talk about their lead weapon manufacturer having a kid. Frank asked. Tony realized his slip-up. He didn't want anyone else to know about Morgan. Obi, who he considers a father figure, doesn't even know about Morgan. But it looks like two new people would know about his ball of sunshine. Morgan. My daughter. You named your daughter Morgan? Frank asked incredulously. It came to me in a dream, so sue me. Tony defended. Anyway, Pepper and I don't want anyone to know about her for reasons exactly like this. I even have her papers held so no one could accidentally find out about her. He explained. Frank had to admire Tony's forward thinking and protectiveness. The kidnapping incident just reinforces Tony's reason to do it. I still think it's too much, though. Especially since she's growing up. Naruto interjected, but he continued when he saw the skeptical look on Tony and Frank's face. She'll never de develop her social skills if you keep her confined longer. Besides, just ask me to look after her, and nothing serious would happen to her. I love the kid too much to let her have anything more than a boo-boo. He said the whole thing seriously. You still need to hire me, though. Fucking hell. Are you a merc or something? Tony exclaimed. Something of that sort. Naruto answered with a shrug before reaching behind him. I forgot to give you this stuff. He said while tossing the items in front of the group. I thought you might need some camping gear. He finished. Frank knelt in front if of the supplies and opened it and lo and behold, a large tent, three sleeping bags, fire starter kits and canteens. Did you miss anything? Tony asked sarcastically while looking over Frank's shoulder. Yup. The sat phone and GPS. Naruto replied with a grin. Tony looked at Naruto disbelievingly, which Frank and Ensign mirrored. I fucking hate you right now. Tony exclaimed. Malibu, Los Angeles. February 13th, 2009, 1500 H local. Phil was driving towards the Stark Mansion in a Shield Standard Issue SUV. This would be the first official contact any S.H.I.E.L.D. agent has had with the Stark family ever since the death of Howard Stark. Of course, Virginia Potts is not officially a Stark, yet. But she's the mother of the Stark heiress, and the person, that makes Stark Industries run smoothly from day to day. As Phil got closer to the Stark mansion, he pulled his car over to a small mansion, compared to the other houses in the neighborhood. He drove the car towards the driveway, stopped in front of the external intercom, rolled down the window, and pressed the talk button. I'm here to visit Uncle Billy. Phil said the prompt key. The house is under the use of S.H.I.E.L.D. to monitor the high-class neighborhood, especially the Stark household. I'm, I'm sorry, but Uncle Billy is playing golf. A female voice replied through the intercom, using one of the code questions. I'll just wait with Cousin Jenny then. Phil answered. The gate swung open not long after, and he drove around the property until he reached the driveway at the backyard. He got out of the car and walked inside the house without missing a step. When he got inside, he was greeted by his longtime friend, Agent Melinda May. Melinda May is one of the few females agents with more black belts hoarded than the Black Widow. She's a 5 feet 3 inches, 42 years old. Asian woman, with dark brown hair and wavy black hair. S.H.I.E.L.D. considers her as one of their best pilots and field combatants. Melinda was a successful figure skater until she decided to quit and pursue martial arts instead. Her reason? Ice is too hard and martial arts have padded floors. 
she later pursued a career with S.H.I.E.L.D. and quickly rose through the ranks. She married a psychiatrist, Andrew Garner, a few years back. But it looks like her fairy tale would come to an end, all because of a fucked-up mission in Bahrain. May and Coulson were sent by S.H.I.E.L.D. to do an index asset evaluation and intake, or a welcome wagon mission involving one Eva Belyakov a year ago. The pair arrived in Manama, Bahrain, with a strike team of 10 agents. It was supposed to be a simple mission, but everything went downhill after they arrived. Eva seemingly controlled a group of Bahrainian gangsters with a young civilian girl as a hostage. The pair decided that the strike team should rush in and take out everyone quickly before the situation could escalate. The team remained in communication until the agents started to suddenly fall out of contact. With the situation quickly spiraling out of control and backup hours away, May decided to go in against Coulson's wishes. She noticed two things immediately, Eva's powers involved conscious control, and her agents are already brainwa brainwashed. She had no choice but to take everyone down using only a knife. When May got to the center of the building, she quickly dispatched Eva to break her control of everyone. She walked over to the civilian girl and cradled her. However, she figured out that it was Eva's daughter, Katya, who was controlling the men. With no other choice, she killed the eight-year-old girl, immediately freeing everyone from the enhanced control. The story of May's exploit was spread throughout S.H.I.E.L.D.'s grapevine, and she acquired one of the most well-known nicknames inside the agency, the Cavalry. Everything has a cost, though. The Bahrain mission caused something to break inside of her. Her life went downhill from there. Melinda's effectiveness in the field dropped sharply, and she was always second-guessing herself. Phil tried to help her regain her flair and passion for the job to no avail. Her marriage with Andrew quickly went downhill as well, and they're now in the final stages of divorce. Currently, she's only doing low-stake field jobs like surveillance until her transfer to desk work is approved. Hey, philosophy. It's great to see you. May greeted Phil with a hug, surprising the other agents under her command. You're here for the Stark's files? She asked after the two separated. Yup. I want to know if I missed anything. Phil replied with a smile, genuinely glad to see his friend. While Phil was answering her question, Melinda noticed the other agents are looking at her weirdly. What are you all looking at? You still have a lot of compiling to do. May said towards the gaping agents, causing them to panic and scurry on to what they were supposed to be doing. Come on. I prepared a data packet last night. She told Phil before leading him up the stairs towards her office. Still scaring people, huh? Phil said with a joking tone. Melinda had to smile at Phil's usual banter, but she didn't engage. She just had no energy in her to continue the conversation. Phil noticed May's lack of energy, but he just filed it away for later. He couldn't do anything else to help her without the possibility of making it worse. When the pair got inside the room, Melinda picked up a phone on top of her desk and handed it over to Phil, who immediately took it. Give me the highlights. It'll take too long to read the whole thing now. Phil told Melinda while pocketing the phone. She took some time to scan her mind through the report and compile the important ones. The previous supervising agent first noticed the kid a year ago. Stark upped his security system and expanded his net well over our observation range. Somebody must have tipped him off because his bodyguard called the FBI about who's watching them. The SA was pulling his hairs out since only second-hand information was coming in for at least a year when he decided to do something drastic. Melinda said the last part, while pulling out a folder and retrieving an aerial photograph from the inside. He ordered satellite surveillance and medium-altitude flybys to get some aerial photographs, and he saw this. She handed over the picture to Philosophy. He immediately focused on the circled area. Stark, Potts, and a kid no one knows about. How the hell does no one know about this? 
Phil asked the question, question that's been bugging him since he first heard that Stark has a kid. A rich and powerful businessman who has connections with influential people. Probably held up her paperwork somewhere down the line. Melinda answered with a shrug. What about the mysterious border? Any idea who it might be? Phil asked. Every one of them is pretty much convinced that it's Naruto who's living with the Starks, but it's better to have some evidence. No. Not really. Melinda answered with a shake of her head. We only know that someone's living with Ben in there because of a series of infrared satellite images. She said while looking through the files and showing a compilation of photographs. There's a heat bloom that shows from this room right here every once in a while. No real pattern for when the room is being used. She switched the photo with another one behind it. When we figured out that someone is staying there, the text started to comb through the pictures and cross-reference it with the logs of visitors, but we couldn't find out who it is. It's like he or she appears and disappears whenever. Phil is now 100% certain that Naruto is the Stark's border. He only knows one guy that could get in and out of anywhere. Naruto probably remained in contact with Tony Stark after the Vegas incident. Talk to me, philosophy. You know something. Melinda urged after seeing a familiar look on Phil's face. The one where he just confirmed something. Phil snapped out of his stupor and looked straight at Melinda with that trademark smile of his. Can't tell you, May. Omega level clearance only and all that. Phil replied with a smug smile. Omega? We don't have an Omega clearance. Melinda retorted, genuinely confused, but Phil flashed an enigmatic smile. Exactly. Phil answered before walking out of the room. Fucking protocols. Melinda exclaimed while following Phil. Phil and Melinda reached the back door when Phil turned around and took something from his pocket. This is a receiver. I'll try to deploy some bugs inside while I'm there. Phil said while handing over a flash drive-like item to Melinda. Thanks. Melinda replied while talking the receiver. Phil suddenly turned serious and stared Melinda straight into her eyes. How are? Phil started. Don't. Melinda interrupted. I'm going to get transferred one way or another. She continued. Okay. Okay. Phil said while raising his hands. I just want to be sure that this is what you really want. It is. Melinda answered sincerely. You should go and interview the secretary slash girlfriend. She finished with a smile. Yeah. I'll see you soon. Phil replied while walking out of the door. As Phil was entering his car, Melinda said one last message. Stop by before you go back. Chapter 50, Rescue Malibu, Los Angeles February 13, 2009, 1530H Local How are they? Pepper anxiously asked as soon as Naruto walked down the staircase. She had been trying to distract herself by playing with Morgan while Happy ran some errands for her. Eh. Last time I checked, sleeping. Naruto answered as he flopped down the sofa. Morgan was too focused on playing with her blocks to rush towards Naruto, as she usually did. Frank took the first watch, followed by Insen, and finally Tony. They'll move at first light. He elaborated. Aren't you supposed to watch over them, or something? Pepper continued with her questioning. There are no terrorists in a 100 kilometers radius of their position. Naruto replied with a shrug. Living ones anyway. He muttered darkly, but Pepper heard it all the same. His statement caused a chill to run down her spine. Why are we letting you play with Morgan alone again? Pepper asked half sarcastically because I'm awesome. Naruto answered seriously. By the way, 
Way, I ran an idea by Tony a few hours ago. Thought I should ask you about it too since it's about Morgan. Pepper immediately went alert, hearing Naruto's statement. Morgan is their number one priority, and anything that concerns Morgan requires her full attention. What did you ask him? Pepper asked Naruto a little warily. A bodyguard job for Morgan. Naruto replied quickly, but he continued when he saw Pepper's perplexed look. Morgan is entering her formative years. You can't expect her to live alone without any contact with other kids. That's why I'm going to be her bodyguard when you low-key announce her and send her to playdates. He had been thinking about it for quite some time. Even though Morgan has a loving family, she will have a hard time developing her social skills without interacting with other kids. Pepper thought about Naruto's offer. Indeed, Morgan is growing up quickly. Having her interact with other kids would only help in her development. The one thing holding both Tony and her back is the level of shitstorm that would come for them. Being the richest man on the planet has its perks. Prestige and comfort are just a few of them. But everything has a drawback. Ever since he was a kid, Tony has been targeted by kidnapping, assassination, sabotage, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Going public with Morgan would shift all the attempts from Tony to their baby girl, and they don't want to rob her of a somewhat normal childhood. Naruto's offer could be the solution to the whole thing, though. Pepper had never seen Naruto in action, only snippets from stories and the results, but all of the signs pointed towards one undeniable fact. Naruto is a weird guy. From what Pepper surmised, Naruto is a fighting powerhouse that could take a take out a whole platoon of Navy SEALs, armed or unarmed. He can get in and out of anywhere with that teleportation ability of his that he used with Tony and the others. Not to mention his bottomless pocket trick. Naruto also has connections with an unknown spy agency, as evident by his super spy girlfriend. The few downsides about Naruto is his sudden bouts of violence and unpredictability. This should cause most parents to pull their kids away from an unstable individual, but this might be precisely what they need. A superhuman that could protect their baby. What did Tony say? Pepper asked, wanting to make sure that they are both on the same side. He asked me if I'm a merc, which is partially true, but I didn't receive a solid answer. Naruto replied with a shrug. You two should probably talk it over when Tony arrives. He finished. Just in time too since Jarvis decided to butt in after Naruto's statement. There's an agent Phil Coulson at the front gate, Ms. Potts. He would like to talk to you about Mr. Stark. Should I let him in? Jarvis asked. Pepper and Naruto immediately perked up after hearing Jarvis's announcement. Pepper was anxious because of the not-so-straightforward kidnapping situation, and Naruto was beating himself up for forgetting Phil's mission. Naruto stood up and hoisted Morgan into his arms, who started squealing happily because she finally noticed Naruto's Naruto's presence. He quickly picked up Morgan's toys and personal effects and stored them away. I'll play with Morgan in her room while you deal with the spook. Naruto told Pepper while picking up Morgan's shoe. And a word of advice, follow your gut about the Coulson guy. He said mysteriously before walking away. Pepper was left to ponder about Naruto's statement, but she still needed to deal with something more pressing at the moment. Jarvis. Let Agent Coulson in. Pepper ordered while cleaning up cleaning up everything she could find that might point to Morgan. That's when she remembered one of Naruto's tactics and followed his direction. And find everything you can about this Phil Coulson and send it to my phone. Of course, Ms. Potts. Agent Coulson is just pulling into the driveway. Jarvis informed Pepper. Thank you, Jarvis. Pepper replied while fixing up her clothes. A few moments later, she heard a knock on the door. It looks like Jarvis decided to let Agent Coulson experience a more human interaction than an AI butler. Pepper walked towards the door and opened it, 
revealing an average-looking man in a suit. Virginia Potts? Phil asked to make sure, to which Pepper nodded. He then pulled out his badge and ID, showing it to her. She noticed that the badge was one that she had never seen before. I'm Agent Phil Coulson of Strategic Homeland Intervention, Enforcement, and Logistics Division, or SHIELD. Never heard of it before. Pepper replied with genuine befuddlement. As the personal assistant of Tony Stark, she has heard of almost every alphabet agency out there, and S.H.I.E.L.D. was definitely not a part of them. That's the way we like it. Phil replied with his trademark smile. May I come in? He asked politely. Sure. We can talk in the living room. Just turn left. Pepper answered while stepping aside. Making sure to always keep the agent in her sight. Phil walked straight towards the living room with confidence. He only sat down on the couch after Pepper gestured for him to do so. She, on the other hand, sat at the opposite end of the sofa. So, what does an unknown organization want with me or, more importantly, my boss? Pepper inquired straightfor straightforwardly. Phil had to chuckle at Pepper's manner of questioning. She wasn't afraid to speak her mind and was confident enough to take control of the conversation away from him. It must be true that redheads have fiery personalities, just basing it on his interactions with Natasha and Pepper. S.H.I.E.L.D. has a particular interest in Mr. Stark. I can't get into why, because it's all top secret, but our organization has his safety and well-being as one of our top priorities. Phil explained. Although we still need to protect the country's national security. He continued after adopting a serious expression. We need to know if there's any chance that Mr. Stark might sell out the country for his safety. He ended while giving Pepper a hard stare. Pepper laughed hard after hearing Phil's statement, which caused him to furrow his eyes to in confusion. Tony bowing out to anyone. It's just not going to happen. Even if the whole world is at stake, he'll just say fuck all of it and do his own thing. Pepper replied while wiping a tear at the corner of her eye. I hate to say it, but Tony would remain an asshole even looking down the barrel of a gun. She finished with one last chuckle. Phil compiled the details of his interviews with Stain and Potts. The two interviewees just further supported some parts of Tony Stark's psych profile. A narcissistic and arrogant individual, with a prototypical character, for a genius playboy billionaire philanthropist, at least that was what was in his file four years ago. Phil made a mental note to tell Fury to update Stark's profile. Preferably with someone getting close to Stark since he showed a disconnect in personality with public and private persona. Are there any details that you could tell me to help with Mr. Stark's case? Any detail at all? Phil asked, subtly starting his interrogation. Nothing, really. Pepper lied. She didn't want to burn Naruto's cover. One of the reasons for taking Tony back to that godforsaken desert is because Naruto wishes for no one to know about him, especially his unique abilities. Although, it was weird how only Tony and a technician were allowed in the demonstration. None of his security detail got the green light to be with him. She added. It's one of the reasons why she was so adamant of not letting Tony go. Only Naruto's reassurance made her confident enough to let him go. Even then, he still got a bunch of shrapnel and a massive hole for an electromagnet in his chest. That is some troubling news. We will look into that. High-profile VIPs with respectable backgrounds are allowed their security detail inside a military base. Phil replied. The technician, do you know who he is? He inquired, looking for any signs of deceit in the redhead's body language. Pepper didn't outwardly show any signs of panic. It's because of her job, which includes lying during negotiations and her presence of mind to think of a cover story for Frank. Yeah. Tony has been talking about a new technician that had a military background. He has been keeping it all hush-hush, 
but he sometimes divulges some details accidentally. Pepper answered. I know for sure that his name is either Frank or Francis. She continued, giving the agent something to work with. Hmm. Phil let out. He doesn't believe for a second that Pepper doesn't know more about Frank Castle, but he couldn't see any signs of distress on her. Anyway. That's all I'm here for. He said while standing up. Expect a quick response from our part. We have already sent a team to find Mr. Stark and to look into his kidnapping. He continued professionally before walking towards the door. Pepper followed closely behind Philosophy. He opened the door and stepped out of the mansion. Ms. Potts. We'll contact you again if there's any progress on Mr. Stark's case. Phil said amicably before walking towards his SUV. And a word of advice for the future. He turned around towards Pepper. There's a baby bottle under the center table. You should check under the furniture if you have any unwanted guests in the future. He finished with his trademark smile before getting in the car and driving away. Pepper was left standing at the door with mouth agape. She only snapped out of her stupor when Naruto spoke from behind her while carrying Morgan. Damn. What a power move. Naruto exclaimed with genuine awe in his voice. I didn't know Phil had it in him. He continued. You know him? Pepper asked a little threateningly, but Naruto remained ignorant to the edge in her tone. Oh yeah. He's a friend of mine. Naruto replied with a shrug. He was about to walk back in, but he saw the disbelieving look on Pepper's face. Where did you think my girlfriend works? He's one of her close friends. Pepper pushed Naruto inside the house and locked the door. And you never thought to mention it? I can't talk about it. I'm not exactly employed by S.H.I.E.L.D., and even if I am, I can't tell you guys about them since you're not immediate family. Naruto retorted when they reached the living room. Besides, where's the fun if you already know, already know about them? He added with a chuckle. Pepper groaned, hearing Naruto's reply. Of course he would put priority on the entertainment factor, if the situation was no real threat to anyone. Is there anything else that I should know about? Yup. Naruto replied with a wide grin. But you're not going to tell me, are you? Pepper said with a sigh, already knowing Naruto's personality. Yup. But I'll say one thing this time. Naruto let out while pulling something out from his pocket. Phil left this thing in between the couches. He's holding a small cylindrical object in his hand. This looks to be a shield remote hacking tool. It's not going to pass Jarvis's firewall, but better safe than sorry. I don't trust everyone in S.H.I.E.L.D. He said the last part entirely seriously. Pepper filed Naruto's statement at the back of her mind. She needs to have a sit-down talk with Naruto and find out more about S.H.I.E.L.D. But for now, there's something she needs to know. How long has S.H.I.E.L.D. known about Morgan? Pepper asked with a narrowing of her eyes. Naruto didn't have to think long about the answer. A year or two ago, I guess. Naruto answered with a shrug. And before you ask, they're not sure if I'm staying here, but they have some suspicions. He continued, still with a wide grin, while crushing the bug. Everything's a joke to you, isn't it? Pepper repeated with a chuckle. Bagram Air Force Base, Afghanistan. February 17th. 2009-0900H Local Hey, Chair Force. We got to go. Clint said as soon as he entered Rody's office. Rody was having one of the longest four days. He has been coordinating with different military branches and departments for Stark's rescue. There's also something he figured out while looking into Tony's case. Everything has just been a series of clusterfucks even before they got to Afghanistan. Too many coincidences and fuck-ups happened for someone to not be pulling strings in the background. 
The appearance of the spooks didn't help with his suspicion. A group of agents with direct orders from the chief of staff arrived three days ago. They were not taking over the whole investigation, but doing their own thing. Rody only ever came in contact with one of the spooks. An agent called Barton. He would have thought that he was just another guy if not for the bow and arrow he was carrying. The weird thing now, though, was Barton wearing a standard army uniform. He had no idea where he got it. Where'd you get that? And where the hell are we going? Rody asked while putting on his field jacket. This? I brought this uniform with me just in case. Clint answered while walking out of the door with Rody close behind him. As for the second question, we're going to pick up Richie Rich. He said as they were getting closer to a whirring up Sikorsky HH-60 Pave Hawk, a search and rescue chopper. You found him. Rody shouted, the sound of the helicopter getting louder, as they were getting closer. Barton didn't answer the question right away. The pair got on the chopper with a six-man crew of the pilot, army soldiers, and shield agents. He waited for Rody to put on the headphones before answering. There was a report of a rocket blowing high up in the sky around 150 kilometers north of here, on the other side of the mountains. The local militia saw it, which moved up the food chain until it got to us. Clint explained. What makes you think Tony the one who fired the rocket? Rody asked skeptically. For all he knew, it might be just some hostiles luring them in. Because 15 kilometers from the launch site, was an outcrop with what is supp supposed to be a cave system, but it has been completely leveled. A huge explosion underneath must have caused the collapse. Clint reasoned. What he left out, though, was the scale of destruction around the area. Only one guy could cause that kind of damage, and it bodes well for Stark, but not the terrorist. Damn. What the hell happened? Rody mused to himself, but it remained unanswered. The chopper flew straight towards their destination for 30 minutes, with only the sounds of the helicopter and occasional radio contact breaking the relative silence. Clint was continuously scanning the surroundings, trying to find anything out of place until he spotted something in the distance. On the left. At the sand crest. Clint shouted after he saw something suddenly burning in the distance. The pilot followed Clint's direction and turned the chopper left. He noticed the fire growing larger as the helicopter turned towards it. As they got closer, Clint saw the stark air with two other people. He recognized Frank Castle, but he didn't recognize the older guy. Rody and the team eventually got a good look at Tony when the helicopter got significantly closer. Rody and a pair of crew members jumped out of the chopper as it landed and jogged towards the group. Hey, Rody. What took you so long? Tony shouted. Chapter 51, Press Conference. Bagram Air Force Base, Afghanistan. February 18, 2009, 1000H Local. Tony, Ensign, and Frank were put through the ringer after they were rescued. They had to endure a battery of tests and exams, especially Tony. The electromagnet in his chest made the doctors really nervous. Good thing Rody helped out a lot by getting the interview pushed back. The military will interview them when they get back stateside. The general was really accommodating. Too accommodating for him, at least. They were now boarding Tony's private jet with Ensign in tow. Tony had managed to convince Ensign to work for him, even if only for a short time. The trio's time in the desert helped them learn a little more about each other, no matter how much they didn't want to talk about themselves. Even Frank revealed some details about himself that were not in his files. Out of everything Tony learned, though, nothing was more eye-opening than Ensign's story. He was from the small town of Gulmira, Afghanistan, where his family had been massacred during the Ten Rings attack that resulted in him getting captured. Ensign had already made peace that he would die and join his family, 
but Naruto's unexpected abilities made it possible for him to leave that cave relatively unscathed. Even after everything, Tony still had to convince Ensign to get on the chopper and not wander in the desert alone for who knows how long. When everything was loaded up and Tony, Ensign, Frank, and Rhodey got in, the private jet slowly started to move towards the runway. So, now that we're finally in private, how did you guys really get out? Rhodey asked. The story Tony kept on telling everyone is just too far-fetched to have been real. Like I told you, I was wearing a suit of armor and fought our way out of there. I then used the armor as a flare when we got some distance away from the cave. Tony replied with a bored tone. It was such a badass story that he couldn't help but tell a shortened version of their harrowing ordeal. However, he made sure to leave out Naruto's part on their escape. Rhodey was left sitting dumbfounded. His blank stare lasted through the liftoff and until the plane reached a cruising altitude. Frank decided that he had enough making fun of the Air Force guy and gave him a hand. He unbuckled his seatbelt and walked towards Rhodey. You know. Frank started, not exactly sure on how to start the conversation. The story is a lot more impossible if you heard the, wh the whole thing. Trust me. It's better just to hear this version. He advised. You will have to ask Whiskers if you want to know everything. Tony interjected. He continued when he received a questioning look. Naruto. Whiskers is Naruto. He's like the only person we know who has whiskers. He deadpanned. Naruto? What the hell does Naruto have to do with this? Rodi asked, genuinely confused. Well, Naruto warned us about the terrorists, for one. He also volunteered Frank here as extra protection. Tony sarcastically replied. As for the rest, you can ask Naruto yourself. All right. All right. I'll have to ask Naruto myself. Rodi said, giving up on getting any more information about what happened. What the hell does Naruto have to do with Tony's kidnapping? Good thing you got out of the caves before it collapsed. He added as an afterthought. We didn't actually see anything after we got out. We just wanted to get as far away as possible. Tony commented. You should have seen what happened. Rhodey giddily said while pulling out his phone. He scrolled through his phone until he found the photo that he was looking for. He called over Ensign so he could show the picture to everyone at once. The small hill and the cave system under it collapsed into a one-kilometer-wide crater. The whole thing is filled with debris and boulders. The military had no choice but to send the engineering corps to sift through the mess. He explained. The trio couldn't believe what they were seeing. They knew that Naruto collapsed the cave system when he got rid of the weapon's cache, but this was the first time that they had seen the aftermath. Ensign couldn't help but feel elated when he saw the decimation of the Ten Rings, or at least a cell of it. Frank's training let him recover from his shock quickly. Even though that amount of destruction has rarely been seen in modern war warfare, which is more focused on precision strikes, he had already seen a lot more horrifying things that happen in real life. Can you tell me more about the guy you had on the retrieval team? Frank suddenly asked, hoping to get rid of the itch that has been bugging him. Which one? Rhodey replied, acting clueless. You know the one, the guy who was really in charge. Frank reiterated with a glare. The grunt sitting in the corner of the helicopter was definitely not a soldier. Throughout his career, he had developed a sixth sense for these kinds of things, and listening to it had never failed him before. Damn. You're too good. Rhodey mused to himself. He took a deep breath while organizing his thoughts. I don't know which agency he works for, but all I know is that he and his team came the day after your kidnapping. They had written authorization from the Joint Chiefs to conduct an investigation on Tony's disappearance. They didn't take over our side of the investigation, 
but they're the ones who found out about your rocket. They didn't want you guys to know who they are, obviously. He explained before remembering a detail that stood out. The weird thing was, the head honcho, Barton, carried a bow and arrow. Probably one of Naruto's weird friends. Tony commented. Don't give me that look, Frank. You're one of his weird friends. He defended after Frank gave him one of those stares. I'm not his friend. I just owed him a favor. Frank retorted. What makes you think Legolas is any different? Tony replied with a smirk. Anyway. I need to call Pepper to send two cars to pick us up. One for me and one to bring you two back to a safe house I have. We'll talk pay later after the press conference Pepper is undoubtedly organizing. He continued, he continued while picking up a phone mounted to the side of the plane. I don't need payment. This is a one-time thing, and it's all pro bono. Frank responded. Just tell Naruto that we're even. He added. Your choice. Tony said with a shrug before retrieving a calling card with his personal number and handing it over to Frank. If you have any problem, though, just call me any time. Frank reluctantly took it after a moment of debate with himself. He reasoned that having someone as powerful as Tony on his side if something went wrong was just too good of an opportunity to pass up. Thanks. Frank replied with gratitude before pocketing the calling card. Van Nuys Airport, Los Angeles. February 18, 2009, 1000H Local. About time you got back. Pepper greeted Tony as soon as he got out of the plane. Behind her is a black limousine and a black SUV. Ah. You have tears in your eyes. I didn't know you cared. Tony replied with a jesting tone. The couple couldn't even greet each other as they normally would since someone might be listening or taking pictures from a distance. The paparazzi are one tenacious bunch. These tears? Pepper said while wiping away the tears she didn't know was forming at the corner of her eye. These are tears of joy. I'm just glad that I don't need to find a new job. She retorted with a smile before turning towards Insen and Frank. The SUV will take you in a fully stocked apartment in downtown LA, help yourselves to anything in there. Insen, Frank, and Rody took their bags from the porter which didn't really have much in it, and walked towards the SUV. Tony and Pepper got in the car after the SUV left. How's Morgan? Tony asked Pepper as soon as they got in. Morgan's fine. She's just missing you a lot. Good thing Naruto keeps on distracting her. Pepper answered. Did you know Naruto's girlfriend is from S.H.I.E.L.D.? What the hell is S.H.I.E.L.D.? Tony inquired expectedly. A secret U.S.-based international spy agency. Pepper replied. Replied. One of their agents came to the mansion to ask if you would ever betray the country. What did you say? That you're too much of an asshole to ever give in to any demands. Pepper answered seriously. Tony had to laugh hard at Pepper's reply. The divider rolled down revealing Happy as the driver. She told you about the interview? Happy asked when he saw Tony laughing. Yup. Tony said after significantly calming down. Oh. Let's buy some cheeseburgers before going to the press conference. Got it, boss. Happy replied with a salute before rolling up the divider. Tony turned his head towards Pepper and gave her a questioning look. You're not going to tell me not to get any cheeseburgers? Tony asked. Nope. Huh? That's new. Tony mused. Backtracking a little bit. An agent came to Afghanistan. Rody couldn't figure out which agency he came from, but it looks like he probably came from S.H.I.E.L.D. Exactly. Agent Carlson, the guy who came by the mansion, said that they were sending someone to work your case. Pepper explained. 
Would you look at that? I thought that agent was just one of Naruto's friends. Tony said, genuinely surprised. He might still be one of Naruto's friends since Agent Coulson is undoubtedly one. Pepper retorted. What the hell? Just how many people does Naruto know? Tony exclaimed. Pepper just answered with a shrug. Seeing that the previous topic reached a natural conclusion, she decided to tackle an issue that was going to be a lot more stressful. I heard Naruto asked you about Morgan. Pepper segued to the topic that had been eating her for quite some time. What do you think of his offer? Tony turned more serious when he heard Pepper's statement. He had been mulling over Naruto's offer for quite some time, and he was reasonably sure that he would accept it. It. All he needed now was Pepper's approval. To be honest, I'm all for it. Tony confessed. No matter how impossible it is, Naruto might be a super soldier, just like the captain. He also has all those weird powers of his that I still can't figure out, and it's seriously making me lose sleep. He commented before taking a deep breath. The only drawback that needs serious consideration is that Naruto tends to go a little overboard, not to mention Naruto's mental state. Pepper released a sigh since they basically arrived at the same conclusion, but she was still apprehensive about accepting Naruto's offer. There was only one thing that can make her change her mind. If he's going to work for us in any capacity, Naruto needs to tell us who or what he is and whatever the hell shield is. Pepper said seriously. Tony couldn't help but agree with Pepper's condition. There's just one thing he needs to point out. We should have probably asked all of that, or at least the first question, before we let him stay in the house, don't you think? Tony stated with a teasing grin. Pepper just gave him an unimpressed stare. Stark Industries, Los Angeles. February 18, 2009, 1100H Local. Tony was walking towards the main lobby of Stark Industries Los Angeles Weapon Division corporate office, with a spring in his step. Some people might not understand it, but a good cheeseburger could make anyone a whole lot happier. He even had two more cheeseburgers in the paper bag that Happy is carrying. As soon as he walked past the front door, he was immediately assaulted by a group of journalists and camera flashes. His security detail moved forward to control the crowd. Tony just shrugged off the attention and strode towards the podium on the stage after taking the bag of cheeseburgers from Happy. Pepper and Happy stayed at the back of the room to watch over the conference. She made sure to place the more reliable journalists at the front with the rowdier ones at the back. This setup would make sure that the noise level from the questioning could somewhat be controlled. Hello. Mic test. One, two, three. Tony said towards the microphone. This just will not do. He mused before taking the mounted mic and walking towards the front of the stage. He sat down with his legs hanging, cheeseburger in his right hand, and the mic in his left. So, who wants to go first? His question caused a commotion with the audience. Almost everyone was raising their hands and shouting their questions, hoping to get an edge over the others. Tony pointed to a blonde journalist wearing a relatively skimpy outfit. It looked like Tony's playboy ways were not entirely gone, and Pepper certainly noticed it, evident by her raised eyebrow. The blonde reporter stood up, revealing her model-like body. Christine Everhart, WHIH World News There are some reports that the military didn't actually rescue you from your captors. Is there any truth to these rumors? Christine asked with an underlying sultry tone. Christine Everhart was a 5 feet 9 inches blonde-haired Caucasian who had one goal in this press conference, try to seduce the Stark billionaire. There were rumors that Tony Stark has not been biting any baits for at least three years. She was here to test that rumor. The easiest way to rise through the ranks was to get an exclusive in any way possible, even using her body to do it. No comment. Tony answered quickly. The military had warned him not to release any details of his capture and rescue. 
he was more than ready to tell the whole story to the public, but he wouldn't be the only one that was going to be affected by the inquiry if he disobeyed that warning. In a completely unrelated note, the guys in Bagram should increase their intelligence gathering net if it took them three days to find a kilometer-wide crater. But of course, he would always find a way around any problem. Pepper rubbed her forehead, already anticipating the shitstorm that would come their way. Tony then pointed to another journalist, a male one. This put off Everhart since she expected her subtle tactic to seduce Tony Stark to work better than just gaining his momentary attention. It was reported that you were rescued alongside two other individuals. Can you tell us more about these two individuals? The reporter asked. Oh, come on. Tony exclaimed. Can't anyone ask a question that I can answer? It's like you guys don't want to write anything. He said with a sigh. The reporters couldn't help but acknowledge Tony's comment. High-profile scenarios involving the military usually have the information tightly controlled, but the challenge it presents just fires up the journalists even more. Just bug the Pentagon if you want answers. He suggested before standing back on top of the stage. Let me give you guys something to write about. He stated, causing the reporters to go silent. Pepper immediately got a bad premonition from Tony's statement, eerily similar to the one she got after the Vegas incident. It looks like Tony wanted everyone to remain in suspense since he took another cheeseburger and set it on the podium. Do you know what he's going to say? Obadiah suddenly asked beside her, slightly surprising Pepper. She turned her head towards him and answered. I have no idea. He didn't tell me anything. Hmm. Let's just hope it's not too big of an announcement. Obadiah replied. Obadiah is using every ounce of his composure not to show any negative expression. All of his plans are crumbling before his, his eyes. There's only one last Hail Mary plan that might work, and he has no control over it. Tony needed to shake the trust of the board of directors for them to start a vote of non-confidence. Some distance away from them, however, is Phil, listening in on the press conference, as well as Potts and Stain's conversation. I might only have been gone for a week, but man did I miss cheeseburgers. Tony said after finishing his second burger. His statement caused some of the journalists to laugh. Anyway. As the CEO of Stark Industries, I'm suspending indefinitely the operation of the weapons manufacturing department as well as other military equipment and transport production companies under Stark Industries. This includes Lockheed, Boeing, Raytheon, and others. All existing contracts would all be put on hold as per Article 4, Paragraph 6. Tony announced. Obadiah felt glee with how much uproar Tony's announcement would cause. Still, Article 4, Paragraph 6 of all standard Stark Industries contract involves deals that may constitute a breach of national security, and there's only one reason Tony would cite it now. Stark Industries will do an audit on all transactions going back 15 years. I want to see every fuck-up that happened. He said entirely seriously. Well, isn't that exciting? He finished with a laugh. The reporters were left speechless, as well as Pepper, Happy, Phil, and especially Obadiah. Only Tony's laughter caused everyone to snap out of their stupor. The whole room was suddenly drowned, with the reporters firing their question questions. I'll head back to the office. We need to get ahead of this before it blows out of proportion. Obadiah told Pepper. He needed to have a team check and balance production and sales. He might not be able to hide it entirely, but he could buy himself enough time to take over the company. You two make sure to change Tony's mind, or he might break the company. He said before walking away. Pepper stared at the retreating form of Obadiah, an idea forming at the back of her mind. She had been monitoring the stock sales since Tony asked her to look over Naruto's stock investment in the company, and she had seen some disturbing moves. Everything might be normal to an amateur, but her experience tells her otherwise. 
It was all a setup for a takeover, and there's only one person who would be in a position for it. Pepper's musing abruptly ended though when Tony spoke again. One statement that will definitely land him on the couch. That's all the time I have. I still need to get home to my family. Tony said while waving his hand dismissingly. Silence once again dominated the room, causing him to laugh internally. It was refreshing to be on the other side of the headache. Although, he could see Pepper at the back of the room, giving him the stink eye. Excuse me? Not to be crass. Christine raised her hand, pulling everyone's attention towards her. But what family? Tony picked up the microphone and walked towards the pepper and happy at the back of the room. When he got to the back, he handed over the bag with the cheeseburger to Happy and reached for something inside it. My daughter and fiancé. Tony said before retrieving a ring box inside the bag and opening it towards Pepper. Or my soon-to-be fiancé if she says yes. Chapter 52, Info Dump Stark Industries, Los Angeles February 18, 2009, 1130H Local Pepper's face turned a shade of red that rivaled her hair. All her cognitive abilities seemed to have simultaneously stopped. Everything outside a small area circling both Tony and her faded away. Tony's proposal might be unorthodox, but it was just like him to do something on a whim. She was about to give him an answer when something barreled through between them and tackled Tony, almost causing him to fall. Daddy. Morgan shouted. The revelation of Tony Stark's relationship going on long enough for him to propose and have a kid was already sufficient enough to make every reporter lose their mind. But the arrival of a little girl, who clearly looked to be at least four years old and had the Stark and Potts features, just further drove the point. Hey, Morgan. Tony greeted in surprise. What are you doing here? He asked after picking up Morgan. Ruto brought me. Morgan answered, pointing to a hallway. She then turned her head towards the people, all the journalists, and cameras pointing towards them. Her inherent shyness due to her relative isolation caused her to try to hide her face in Tony's neck. Who are they, Daddy? She asked. Don't mind them, honey. Tony softly said. He felt Morgan nod before setting herself in his arms. He looked back towards Pepper. Pep, I still need an answer. In the hallway that Morgan had pointed to, Phil and Naruto were watching the family interaction that occurred after Naruto let Morgan run towards her father. Hey, philosophy. How are you? Naruto asked as he stopped beside the shield agent. Everything's fine. Phil replied with his trademark smile. I have to say you're making my job a lot harder. He stated. Now, why is that? Naruto retorted with a teasing smile. Well, you managed to make most, if not all, protective surveillance measures on one of the agency's VIPs impossible. Phil replied. Isn't that like a breach of privacy? Not if Howard Stark himself technically hired us. Oh yeah. That. Naruto said sheepishly, forgetting why S.H.I.E.L.D. was interested in Tony. Either way, you guys suck at guarding him. Him. He added childishly before extending his tongue. Phil couldn't deny Naruto's statement since what he said wasn't exactly a lie. There were a lot of restrictions in place, preventing them from doing their job to its full capacity, which led to Tony Stark's Vegas fiasco and kidnapping. Philosophy Naruto called him with a serious tone. This caused Phil to turn his head towards Naruto, who was still looking at the family. Do you guys have any idea who the mastermind is? He asked. Phil would have acted clueless now but Naruto's serious expression made him change his mind. Nothing concrete, but I have a guess. We're looking into it now. Phil answered, making sure to leave out the name. His goal was to either stop Naruto from investigating further, 
or at least bargain that information away, but it looked like none of it would work today. Naruto had no patience to play the back and forth that Phil was clearly trying to start, so he did something a little more drastic. He turned his towards Phil with his shinigan activated. Phil slowly opened his eyes. He knew something happened, but nothing seemed to be amiss except for a weak headache. Trusting his instincts, he tried to recall the last few moments, but he felt a gap in his memory. So Obadiah Stane, huh? That makes sense. Phil heard Naruto say out of nowhere, looking at the family. That simple statement gave Phil an idea of what might have happened. What did you do? Phil asked, slightly panicked. Never mind that. Naruto retorted dismissively, causing Phil to frown. He looked towards Phil and continued. Don't do anything to Stain. I'm not going to do anything either. Tell Fury to let Tony handle it for now, but be ready to step in at any time. He said without any room for argument. His demeanor suddenly changed to a more relaxed one. Looks like Pepper is about to answer. Pepper stared Tony straight into his eyes and said, I'm hyphenating. Pepper's answer caused Tony to smile brightly, which she mirrored. It also sent the reporters clamoring towards the family, and it looked like their security detail would be overwhelmed. This looks to be getting out of hand. Naruto said before walking towards a blind corner. Phil had no idea what Naruto was going to do, but it was quickly answered with Naruto's reappearance. He was now wearing a suit similar to Stark's security detail, and behind him was a small army of similarly dressed people with different faces. Follow me. They'll definitely want to talk to you. Naruto quickly jogged towards the venerable horde, followed by his henged clones. He went straight towards the family while the clones pushed the reporters back. His appearance, though, took the family and Happy aback. Mr. Stark, Ms. Potts. The car is ready. Naruto said while pointing towards the exit. He also gave Happy a small gesture to get the car, which Happy understood evident by his sudden departure. Naruto led the family out of the building with Coulson close behind. Congratulations, guys. Naruto greeted when they finally got some distance away from the chaos. I thought Tony would puss, sh it back again. He commented, making sure to make his statement kid-friendly for Morgan. Thanks. Tony replied slowly before changing the topic. Why did you bring Morgan, and who's the guy behind you? That's Agent Coulson and answer the question, Naruto. Pepper interjected while giving Naruto a stern glare. Well, Morgan and I were playing with the TV on. I'm scrolling through the channels when I came around a live interview of yours. When you reached the part where you revealed your daughter, I came right away. Naruto explained. Your plan to suspend your weapons manufa manufacturing will bring some heat down on you and your new family. So what better time to fully reveal Morgan? Then after your announcement, to give those piranhas something to report on. I just didn't expect you to propose right after. He added. Look at the bright side, though. No one will talk about your statement for sure after all of that. Naruto's answer was exactly what they would expect from him. A stupid plan that would somehow work one way or another. Still, just thinking of the public relations nightmare headed their way gave Pepper a headache so she decided to change the topic for now. Why is your agent friend following us? Pepper asked after they got through the door. You're going to want to talk about S.H.I.E.L.D., aren't you? Then who better to ask than an agent himself? Just don't expect him to answer. Naruto replied. Phil, on the other hand, started thinking about everything he could say without repercussions. Naruto. I'll follow behind. I need to make some calls. Phil said before walking towards a parked SUV, a distance away. Hmm. Phil will probably call Fury. Naruto mused right before a limo stopped in front of them. The family got on the back seat, 
while Naruto got in on the passenger side. Hey, Happy. Find anything new to do? Aside from upping the security protocol as usual. He said as a start to a conversation, adding the last part as a quip. Hmm. Not much. I started boxing again, though. Trying to up my skills just in case. Happy answered. He was also thinking about how he might teach Tony some moves to make him be able to defend himself. Nice. Call me if you ever need a sparring partner. Naruto replied. On the other side of the screen, Tony and Pepper are sitting facing each, each other with Morgan sleeping beside Tony, holding onto his arm. So we're going to hire him, right? Tony asked Pepper sheepishly. We have no other choice, do we? You basically announced it on live television, and Naruto brought Morgan. Pepper replied with a raised eyebrow. But it would be less stressful to hire a group of ex-special forces. We should probably look into that. She added half seriously. An army of every SAS and SEALs combined can't hold a candle to Naruto. Ask Rodi to show you the crater to understand what I'm saying. He'll know what I'm talking about. Tony suggested with a serious tone. Pepper immediately filed Tony's suggestion away for later. By the way, I'm uploading Jarvis in the corporate system. Why? Pepper asked, genuinely confused. I'm going to upgrade Jarvis's system to do a full sweep of everything. There will also be an old school audit, but only you and I will know about Jarvis being in the system. Tony explained. Pepper's expression softened. She could see an underlying tension in Tony's demeanor. Be honest with me, Tony. Why are you doing all of this? What happened over there? Pepper asked softly. Tony released a sigh. He should have known that Pepper could see his anxiety. You know that a mortar caused this, right? Tony asked, to which Pepper nodded while trying to hold back her tears. What I didn't tell you was that the mortar had my name on it. Your name? I don't understand. The mortar was made by Stark Industries. Tony clarified. This drew a gasp from Pepper. The whole thing finally made sense to her. It's not just that. They had a massive cache of weapons with Stark Industries on it. On our way out of the cave, we blew up as much of it as possible. He explained. We apparently missed a cache inside the cave since we were rushing to get out, but Naruto took care of it. The pair sat in silence after Tony's statement, individually thinking about how the company should move forward in the future. You know what? I hate all this serious talk. Let's talk about something more fun. Tony said with a smile. Let's talk about the wedding. Pepper had to smile at Tony's redirection. She could always depend on Tony to add some levity to her life. Natasha's Safe House, New York February 18th, 2009, 1400H Local Hey, N.A.T. There's some leftover pizza in the fridge if you like. Jessica greeted Natasha as soon as she got into the apartment. This was one of the few moments of free time she had had throughout the week due to the increased workload because of her accelerated program. Thanks, but I already ate. Natasha replied before tossing her bag at the side of the door and flopping on the couch beside Jessica. Jessica saw her tensed shoulder, so she decided to give her a massage. MMM. That's the spot. Thanks. She said in gratitude while holding back her moans. Must have been a stressful mission if you have this much tension in you. Jessica asked rhetorically. By the way, Naruto hasn't come by for at least three days. She added. Sounds about right. Natasha commented softly. I guess I can tell you about the mission this time. She said. Natasha rarely tells Jessica about her missions since a lot of them are above top secret 
but from time to time, she would let out vague mission parameters and let Jessica work it out. Still, there are low-priority or public-related missions that come her way, so she tells Jessica the whole thing. All of Natasha's efforts to hide it were sometimes for not since Naruto would occasionally get carried away with his storytell storytelling and let out details of her missions to Jessica. You know about Tony Stark's kidnapping? Natasha inquired since it would be a whole lot easier if Jessica knows about that piece of news. Yup. Billionaire kidnapped in Afghanistan late last week. Found yesterday, I think. Jessica replied. I might not be updated in current events, but that kind of news would find a way to reach everyone. She added with a smug grin. Good to know. Natasha said with a smile. Anyway, due to reasons I can't tell you, S.H.I.E.L.D. has a special interest in the guy. It's been all hands on deck since news of his kidnapping got to us. I have been working my contacts to find anything new about the situation. She explained. As for Naruto, he might be doing the same thing as I am, or he could be babysitting Stark. Why the hell would Naruto babysit Stark? Jessica asked, genuinely confused. Didn't Naruto tell you? Jessica shook her head no to Natasha's question. Naruto has known Tony Stark personally since almost the moment he arrived here. Search for Tony Stark Vegas Incident. You'll find an unnamed partner of his. That's Naruto. So he has been causing trouble from the moment he got here. Good to know. Jessica said with a chuckle. I also have a suspicion that Naruto sometimes stays at Stark's mansion. Natasha added. So living with two hot ladies willing to have sex with him isn't enough? He needs to live in a mansion too. That's good to know. Jessica replied sarcastically. Don't worry about that. I'm reasonably sure Naruto is worth at least a billion dollars, so he could buy himself a mansion anytime he wants. Add to the fact that he could create anything he wants out of thin air, and he could be the richest person in the whole world. There must be another reason why he's staying there. Natasha said. That's when she noticed that Jessica's massage stopped, so she turned around and saw a shocked Jessica. Hey, Jess. Are you all right? All right? Jessica froze when she heard how much Naruto was worth. She hadn't even thought about how Naruto's creation ability could be used to make anything he wanted. That train of thought somehow made her feel empty inside. All she could think about is the distance between Naruto and her. The reason why she never dated anyone after Sterling is because of her inability to process emotions well. Being an introvert with PTSD and survivor's guilt syndrome can do that to anyone. The only reason she accepted Natasha's weird offer was because she was in a bad position in life, and one of her outlets was sex. Now, she somehow caught feelings for a guy in a relationship with what could arguably be called her best friend. What a fucked up situation to be in. Hey, Jess. Are you okay? Natasha asked while shaking Jessica a little. Yeah. Yeah. I'm fine. Jessica reassured her as she got out of her stupor. Natasha stared at Jessica for a moment. As an expert in reading body language and psychology, she could accurately guess what Jessica's thinking. She internally smiled since she can now move to the next part of her plan. You know what? I know that Stark would hold a press conference right around now. Natasha said as she reached for the remote. Okay. Jessica weakly replied. Natasha turned on the TV and surfed the channels until she found what she was looking for. As the CEO of Stark Industries, the television blared out, running through Tony Stark's statement. Natasha could already picture the mess his announcement would cause. She knows for a fact that S.H.I.E.L.D. got a lot of their armaments from Stark Industries through the military. Fury would surely fucking lose it. Or my soon-to-be fiancé if she says yes. 
so that's why he's rarely in the news these past few years. Good for him. Jessica commented when the TV showed Tony propose proposing to the redhead. That's Virginia Potts. His longtime assistant. Natasha said, giving Jessica some context. That's when a kid suddenly runs straight towards Tony. And that's probably their daughter. Three years old, I think. We have no records on her. Jessica chuckled at Natasha's disgruntled face. It's like she couldn't believe that S.H.I.E.L.D. was unsuccessful in finding anything concrete about a little girl. Her amusement stopped when she saw what was happening on the television. Hey, N.A.T., isn't that getting a little dangerous? Jessica asked, referring to the venerable stampede headed towards the family. Fuck. That's what happens when stuff happens too much too soon. Natasha commented. She couldn't do anything being 4,000 kilometers away. A few moments later, though, the pair saw something that they were not expecting. Isn't that Naruto? Jessica said while pointing to Naruto wearing a suit. Yup. Natasha replied with a groan. And that's my co-worker behind him. She pointed to an average-looking man behind Naruto before reaching for the remote and turning the TV off. I don't want to deal with all of that while I'm on my break. Natasha decided that now was as good as time as any to deal with something that she had been thinking about for quite a while. Jessica saw Natasha leaning on the couch beside her, making sure she's comfortable. Natasha then patted her things, urging Jessica to lie on it. After Jessica laid down reluctantly, Natasha started running her hands through Jessica's hair. Jess, I want you to be honest with me. Natasha said out of the blue, blue, causing Jessica's heart rate to skyrocket. A super spy trained to remain emotionless, and an emotionally stunted enhanced having a heart to heart, what could go wrong? Are you in love with Naruto? Natasha could feel Jessica immediately tense. She continued brushing Jessica's hair to calm her down, but seeing that Jessica wouldn't answer, Natasha started talking again. In Naruto's world, there's a law called the Clan Restoration Act or CRA. It says that when a clan is down to the last few members, each surviving member could be paired with two or more individuals to increase the clan's population rapidly. Natasha explained. Polygamy and polyamorous relationship is the norm in their world due to the imbalance between genders. Do you understand what I'm getting at? Jessica already knew about all that, although she didn't give any of it a second thought. It was a concept so foreign to her that she just pushed away at the corner of her mind. So, there's no reason for all of us to be together unless you don't want to. Natasha whispered to Jessica's ear. There's just one thing you need to know before deciding. I haven't talked to Naruto about all of this, but I'm giving you an out after you hear what I'm going to say. She felt Jessica nod slowly. We both know Naruto is an immortal. I managed to talk him into considering making me partially immortal. I know it's a stupid idea, but I just can't imagine Naruto being alone throughout eternity. She explained. You want to doom yourself into eternity for a guy? I thought you were supposed to be immune to feelings? Jessica retorted half-jokingly after a few minutes of silence. She then stood up and walked towards the door. Don't worry, N.A.T. She reassured when Natasha when she saw Natasha's worried expression. I'll come back. I don't know what my answer will be, but I won't just up and go. She said before before walking entirely out of the door. Damn. Too much too soon. Natasha said to herself, forgetting her statement earlier. Jessica, on the other hand, had no idea where to go. Ever since Nat and Naruto came into her life, it had been like a roller coaster ride, and she was not sure if she liked it. Why can't everything be simple? Jessica felt like she was slowly drowning in her thoughts. As a desperate measure to talk to someone, she took her phone from her pocket and dialed a number. After a few rings, somebody finally answered. She released a deep breath before talking. 
Hey, Trish. I need someone to talk to. Can we meet somewhere? Chapter 53, Coffee Talk. Downtown Manhattan, New York. February 18th, 2009, 1600 H Local. Come on. You fought in a Russian underground fighting rink. This isn't that different. Jessica said to herself, while walking back and forth in front of a Starbucks. She had no idea why she was more nervous about the prospect of talking with her adoptive sister than going into a bar fight. You're being stupid. Just go in there and talk to her. She whispered. Jessica was debating with herself if she should just cancel the whole impromptu meeting with her sister when the choice was taken away from her. Jess. A voice suddenly called her name from behind her. When Jessica turned around, she saw a woman walking towards her. The woman's name is Patricia Walker, or simply Trish, though she called herself Patsy before her whole image change. She's a 5 feet 8 inches Caucasian woman with blonde hair and green eyes. She is currently wearing a brown coat with what's more than likely a dress underneath and stiletto heels. No one could deny her beautiful face and sexy figure. Trish was a talented individual who quickly became a young star. And just like other young stars, the newly found freedom and pressure of her profession caused her life to go down the drain. Even at Jessica's lowest point in her life, she didn't reach Trish's level. The, the last time Jessica even saw her sister was at a club when she stopped Trish from having a one-night stand with the drug-dealing owner. Trish voluntarily entered into rehab after that incident. The adoptive siblings hadn't seen each other for more than three years though Jessica still kept track of Trish's whereabouts. Trish was able to turn her life around and is now working as a producer at a radio station. Jessica stood frozen for a few moments, studying how healthy her sister looked compared to when she last saw her. After she snapped out of her stupor, she walked towards Trish and gave her a quick hug. This time, it was Trish who was shocked since for as long as she had known Jessica, she had never initiated a hug or any other sign of physical affection. The most she would do was pat someone on the shoulder. It looked like she wasn't the only one who changed in the past three years. Trish decided not to point this out cause this may cause Jessica to clam up. She instead hugged her tightly. Let's get inside and warm up. Trish suggested when they separated. Jessica nodded weakly before the pair entered the coffee shop. You still want the same thing? She asked, to which Jessica nodded again. Okay. I'll order for us. Just find a seat. Jessica nodded again before walking away. Trish was surprised again. Jessica prides herself as a strong independent woman and wouldn't take any form of charity from anyone. Jessica would always insist on buying her drink and even paying for her guest. Whatever caused her to change this much must be something huge. Or it could all just be a side effect of whatever distressed her enough to call an essentially estranged sister. Jessica, on the other hand, was sitting on a table staring at nowhere in particular. Her brain was working in overdrive. The talk she had with Natasha really messed up her mind. So much so that she didn't notice Trish sitting in front of her until Trish practically shoved the coffee up her nose. Latte with two pumps of caramel and a cream cheese bagel. Trish said with a smile. Thanks. Jessica said as she took the coffee and bagel. She took a sip of the coffee before looking back to Trish. So how are you? I heard you got a job with WNEX. She asked. Of course, she already knew a lot about Trish's life, including that little piece of information, but it's better to start with some small talk. Good to know you're still checking up on me. Trish commented with a teasing grin, though Jessica only gave her a raised eyebrow. Yup. Got a job as a production assistant a year and a half ago. Worked my way up to a producer. Although, I just heard that I'd be able to get my own show that I'll host. She explained. That's awesome. 
Jessica genuinely said. What are you going to do with your show? Hmm. Not sure yet, but I'm going to pitch a talk show about helping other people. Trish answered. I might not be a superhero, but I might be able to help other people. I say it's still a dream come true. She continued, referring both to Jessica's abilities and her childhood dream about being a superhero. But enough about all of that. Let's get to the reason why you called me. She said a lot more seriously. Don't get me wrong. I love that you called me, but you're obviously dying to talk about what's on your mind. She finished. Jessica released a deep sigh after Trish's statement. She called Trish to talk about her unique situation, but she didn't want Trish to think she was just using her. There was also the fact that she didn't really want to talk about her strange relationship with her roommates. After a few moments of thinking, she finally decided to tackle the topic head-on. How open-minded are you? Jessica asked with a soft voice. Trish raised an eyebrow and looked at Jessica like she was asking a stupid question. You already know the answer to that. With my history, it would be pretty hypocritical of me to think any less of people for what they do. Trish explained. Well, what do you think about joining a threesome? That's pretty low on the list. That's something a lot of people experience in college. Trish commented. I'm pretty sure I did a lot more than a threesome. She half-jokingly added. Jessica took a bite of the bagel and a sip of her coffee. She noted that the coffee was just increasing her nervousness. How stupid is this coffee idea? We should just have gone to a bar. Jessica mused, causing Trish to release a light chuckle. Ugh. I can't tell you the whole thing. We would go to prison the moment I blurted out. Trish was surprised at Jessica's assertion. How does a threesome cause someone to go into prison? You should start with what you can tell me. Trish suggested. Jessica nodded, seeing that was the only reasonable thing she could do. So, I found a guy who has a stronger version of my condition. Jessica started, referring to her superhuman strength and durability. I now know for a fact that there are a lot of people like me, and there's an organization that monitors all of us. I can't tell you more about them, though. They're listening in on us right now. Trish suddenly turned a little paranoid, looking around, trying to find something amiss, but she couldn't find anything. The guy in the red hoodie be behind you, and the chick in the dress to my left. There's also the beige SUV parked outside. Don't look at them. Jessica pointed out. Living with Naruto and Natasha honed her already impressive observation skills. It also helped with the lessons they taught about espionage, self-defense, and intuitive thinking. Fuck. You're under surveillance? Trish asked disbelievingly. Not all the time. They don't surveil me at home, and they don't use audio surveillance. Think of it as protecting me from anyone that might take an interest, since that's how they do it with nonviolent individuals. Jessica retorted, shrugging off Trish's concern. But never mind about that, the guy I'm talking about has a girlfriend. They were serious but not together long before I came into the picture, or was pulled into the mayhem. Were? How long ago was this? Trish asked. More than a year and a half ago, I think. Jessica answered. The girlfriend was my neighbor that had moved into the building a year before all this, and the guy has a weird living arrangement that caused him to stay at my neighbor's apartment most of the time. The whole building knew when he was there. Why? Does he cause trouble or something? No, not really. Jessica said sheepishly. It's just when he and my neighbor had sex. You could hear my neighbor moaning to kingdom come. And since he's a super, you could feel the building shake. She explained. I'm not even sure how Nat survived. She whispered to herself, but Trish heard it all the same. So your neighbor's name is N.A.T. 
You might as well spill the name of the guy. Trish reasoned. Jessica released a sigh. The name Naruto isn't as common as Nat here in the States. Trish could easily find Naruto through her connections. I can give you an alias of his. Some people call him Nathan. Jessica said. Wow. An alias, huh? What is he a spy? Trish asked rhetorically with a teasing grin. No. Not him. Nat is. Jessica retorted, leaving Trish slack-jawed. They have a weird romance, and I can't get into that now. She added. Anyway, Nat basically tapped out against Nathan in bed, so she pulled me in. And of course you said yes. Yup, and it has continued up until now. What happened? Trish asked. Nat asked me if I would like to enter a more permanent relationship. Jessica answered, not really sure how to phrase it. She would leave Nathan to be with you? Trish inquired for clarification. Jessica slammed her head at the table. She was stressing over how hard it was to explain her situation. No. No. It's a menage a trois type deal. And it was this Nat that asked you? Nathan didn't pressure her in any way whatsoever? Trish questioned to be sure. No way. Nat practically forced NAR. Nathan to accept the arrangement. And when Nat asked me this afternoon, Nathan has been AWOL for at least three days. Jessica explained, glossing over her almost slip up. Don't get me wrong, but is he gay or something? Oh. That's a definite no. Jessica replied, while her cheeks reddened. That's right. He's basically a beast in bed if he can keep up with you. Trish teased before going back to the topic. If you're okay with the arrangement and you like at least one of them, why not? She suggested. You like at least one of them, don't you? Jessica shyly nodded. It's the guy, right? Jessica nodded again. Then what's the problem? Jessica took a moment to think. If she was honest with herself, she was ready to accept Natasha's offer, but when she heard about Nat's plan for the future, it caused her to think twice. Nathan has a weird lineage. Jessica started. He came from an isolated place where he's basically a member of royalty. Because he's the last surviving member, he's expected to have multiple wives. She explained. There's an even bigger problem that would cause most people to back away, but I can say that if I don't change, I'll be left behind. Although I can still join whether I change or not. She finished, thinking about Naruto's immortality and Natasha's plan to join in the future. Is that change good or bad? Trish asked. She was not one of those people who advocates not to change for anyone since she knows that not all changes were bad. Best I can say is that if everyone in the world were offered the choice, it would be a 50 50 split. Jessica answered. Immortality is one of those divisive topics. What the hell? Why can't you just tell me? Because either you won't believe me or everything you know about how the universe works would be turned upside down. Jessica replied. Aren't you exaggerating this just a little bit, Jess? Ha ha ha. I'm not exaggerating at all. Well, fuck. Trish commented. I don't know what to tell you, Jess. I think you're the first person ever to experience this kind of problem. She said with a sigh. The first time she saw her sister again, and Jessica decided to bring in a major headache. If every one of her future callers asked her about problems like this, she would probably just quit. All I can say is do what you think you want and deal with the consequence later. You don't have to decide anything for now either. It doesn't seem like they're forcing you. Jessica listened to what Trish said and arrived at one inescapable fact. Ugh. You're useless. That's what I was thinking too. 
Jessica replied with a groan before dropping her head onto the table. Natasha's Safe House, New York February 18, 2009, 2100H Local Good to be home. Naruto exclaimed as soon as he got into the apartment. Naruto had a pretty long week. Between babysitting Tony and distracting Morgan, he barely had time to check on Nat and Jessica to make sure they were okay. After the limo got to Tony's downtown apartment, they noticed that Phil wasn't following them. Naruto surmised that Phil was called in by Fury to prevent Phil from spilling anything. Tony and Pepper tried to pump Naruto about S.H.I.E.L.D., but he just brushed everything off and told them he would answer questions some other time. Naruto went straight inside Tony's apartment before flopping on the couch. Tony and Pepper discussed a lot of topics that took them hours to finish. It included Inson's job interview, Frank's payment, some small talk with Rhodey, and a whole range of topics. Morgan eventually woke up, so he relegated himself with babysitting duty. Adulting isn't really his thing. When Naruto noticed the conversation winding down, he silently said goodbye to Morgan before placing his hand on Frank and promptly disappearing, surprising everyone. Naruto dropped off Frank to the nearest Horatian mark near Frank's house, before quickly disappearing again. He just didn't have enough energy to do anything else, but to cuddle with Natasha, and bond with Jessica. Nat, Jess. Anyone home? Naruto loudly asked through the apartment. He tries to only use his worldwide sensing ability for long periods, unless he's specifically looking for someone. Being able to sense anything in the world takes away all the fun in life, and was just plain creepy. When no one answered, he immediately activated his sensing ability, as well as his shinigan in worry. Weirdly enough, he found Natasha in her dance studio at an old warehouse, he renovated for her to support Natasha's love for ballet. But due to Nat's hectic schedule, she only does it when she's stressed and worried. Even her negligible chakra reflected her mood. On the other hand, Jessica was walking around Central Park. Her chakra was also turbulent, showing her more than probably chaotic feelings and thoughts, although it was slowly ebbing away. Both of them having chaotic chakra signatures couldn't be a coincidence. Something probably happened between the two. Seeing that Natasha was in a secured area, he decided to Horatian towards Jessica, who was coincidentally sitting underneath one of his accidental Horatian gate trees. After Jessica left from her impromptu meeting with Trish, she wasn't any closer to finding a solution to her headache. She decided to take a long walk around the city, eventually working her way towards Central Park when it became dark. As Jessica was walking around, she came across a cherry blossom tree. Although it was weird to see a cherry blossom so far away from the rest, she just brushed it off, sitting on a bench next to the tree. Somehow, this particular cherry blossom tree was calming her down. Something about it seemed familiar to her. Jessica's peace and serenity didn't last long, though. What you thinking about? Naruto asked after suddenly appearing next to Jessica. She was naturally shocked by his appearance, causing her to almost jump high up into the air. Naruto. What the hell? When did you get back? Jessica rapidly asked after calming herself down. She long gave up on trying to rid Naruto of that particular nasty habit of his. I got home a few minutes ago to an empty apartment. Naturally, I was worried since I know you guys were home this afternoon. That's why I tried to find you too. I immediately knew something was wrong when Natasha was doing ballet. Your chaotic chakra signature just proved my point. Naruto answered before invading Jessica's personal space, causing her to lean back. She also pulled up her scarf to hide her reddening cheeks. So, tell me, Jess. What happened? Jessica should have expected the question. Naruto was a straightforward guy who would always choose to barrel through a problem, then think about it for too long. She must have rem remained stationary for too long since Naruto was already starting to poke her cheeks like a kid.
You okay, Jess? Naruto asked, unconsciously flashing his puppy dog eyes. Yeah. Yeah. Jessica replied with a shake of her head before releasing a sigh. I can't tell you what happened. Nat said some stuff that shook me up, that's all. She explained. Can't tell me, huh? That just makes me want to know about it more. Naruto teased. But I'm going to let it slide for now. Although, I need you ladies to talk it out. Your stress levels are off the roof. Good thing yours is going down. Yeah. I just felt calmer when I got near this tree. Jessica replied. You just had to break the peace. She continued cheekily. Naruto released a pure-bellied laugh. When he calmed down, he turned his head around towards the cherry blossom tree. You do know that this is one of my trees? Naruto asked. Your tree? Jessica asked, confused by his statement. Yup. Naruto said. This tree is one of the accidental physical manifestations of my dimensional anchors. I didn't even know the flash of light that happened along with the trees when I arrived. I only found out about it while I was traveling. He explained. So it's my tree. It absorbs a whole lot of nature chakra and releases some in a controlled manner. That's probably why you feel calm. Jessica finally had the reason for the really weird calming feeling. I should have gone to Central Park sooner if it's like this. Jessica commented. It probably wouldn't have worked before. Naruto retorted. If this affected everybody, we would see people everywhere. Only you and Nat should be affected because you both experienced nature chakra from me. He continued. Anyway, want me to bring you to Nat, or should I just leave? He asked. Jessica thought about it for a moment. She hated that she couldn't seem to make a straightforward decision, even after all the time, time she that she had spent thinking about it. Let's just get this over with. Jessica replied, which Naruto understood. He reached for Jessica's hand before disappearing. Chapter 54, Starks in the Know Natasha's Dance Studio, New York February 18, 2009, 2200 H Local The Red Room was a Russian spy program that developed super spies. Their preferred recruits were orphaned girls or females who were sold by impoverished families to the government. They took young girls, five years old being the oldest, and trained them in batches. The program itself was one of the projects that originated from the Cold War. They aimed to create spies that could infiltrate anywhere and get close to anyone. The girls would be taught everything a spy should know. They were trained in hand-to-hand, -hand, ranged, and unorthodox combat strategies, seduction, information gathering, espionage, and covert operations. All of this was done while they were slowly being brainwashed with subtle suggestions and propaganda to think of the motherland as being above everything else. One of the cover stories for the Red Room was that they were a Russian ballet troupe that trains prima ballerinas. They were obviously taught ballet to reinforce that story. Natasha held on to ballet as a hobby, practicing it even after escaping from the Red Room. Although, she doesn't do it as much as she wants. That was why Natasha was touched when Naruto gifted her a private and secure dance studio. It also has an underground shooting range, dojo, and gym. Natasha had been dancing for almost six hours when the warehouse security system, placed by Naruto, informed her that someone had entered the warehouse. Judging by the lack of red alerts, the visitor must have been Naruto. Although she still retrieved her gun in preparation for the off chance of someone managing to break through Naruto's over-the-top security system, she also wiped some sweat off to make herself presentable. When Natasha heard footsteps on the other side of the door, she subtly concealed the gun behind her. This was to give herself the option to surprise her possible opponent. So it was a surprise that it was neither Naruto nor a stranger that walked through the door but rather Jessica. 
Nice place you got here, N.A.T. Jessica commented confidently, but Natasha could see the underlying tension. Yeah. I should have brought you over sooner. Natasha replied with a smile before placing the gun down with her other stuff. How'd you get in anyway? She asked although she was reasonably sure what the answer would be. Naruto brought me. Jessica answered, confirming what Natasha thought. He basically forced me to talk to you. Why? Something about the state of our chakra bothering him or something. Jessica explained, not remembering Naruto's explanation. He got home a few hours ago, and he couldn't find us. So in a Naruto-ish fashion, he tracked us both down. I have no idea why he came to me, though. Probably because I'm here. This place is more secure than the White House. Natasha commented. Although she knows that the White House has a laughable security system. Fury occasionally sends her in to test weaknesses, and she always finds at least a dozen gaps. But the analogy still works. So, where's Naruto anyway? She asked while stripping off her clothes, not minding that she had an audience, to change into something not drenched in sweat. Jessica's eyes were glued to the mini strip show that Natasha was performing. Nat had such a high degree of refined sexuality that she has no trouble seducing even straight ladies or gay men. Jessica snapped out of her stupor when she noticed that Nat had already already changed and was now staring at her. He said something about getting out of our hair for a while and going back to L.A. Apparently, the Starks wants to hire him to protect their kid. Jessica answered. Huh. Fury should probably know about this. Natasha said to herself before taking her gym bag and walking towards the underground garage with Jessica following close behind. But it's not my job to tell him. I'm on vacation. She continued a little too happy. The pair continued walking towards the garage, not particularly eager to talk with each other. Both Natasha and Jessica understood each other's messages to delay the conversation for as long as possible. The two walked towards Natasha's black 2008 Aston Martin Vantage V8, customized and upgraded to be a high-performance heavy-duty car. She was reasonably sure that Naruto did something to it as well since it handles better than she expected, but she couldn't find any unusual changes or modifications. Nat got on the driver's side, while tossing her gym bag to the small space behind her seat, while Jessica got in on the passenger side. Natasha drove out of the garage after making sure the auto-lock function of the facility activated. You want to go anywhere? Natasha asked, having no real idea where they should go, but Jessica shook her head. All right, let's just drive around. See where it leads us. She suggested. Of course, it was not a random decision on her part. It was a calculated move that would prevent Jess from bolting somewhere mid-talk. Are you serious about what you said earlier? Jessica blurted out after a few minutes of deafening silence. Which part? Natasha countered. All of it. Jessica replied. But let's start with the immortality thing first. That's true. Natasha said after releasing a sigh. I was always taught to kill my emotions. That it was just an occupational hazard since you would drown in guilt if you feel stu stuff. Naruto was the first person that made me feel something more. She explained. Don't get me wrong. I was never emotionally dead, but I was prepared to die without feeling any form of romantic love. The closest person I almost felt something like this for was my work partner but nothing ever came of it since I figured out that he has a family. Well, that sucks. Jessica commented. But that still doesn't answer why. I still don't believe that it's just because you feel sorry for him. Him. She said, changing Natasha's previous reason to the crudest way possible, which slightly irked Nat. 
Natasha took a few moments to think of an answer that would encapsulate at least half of the reason why she would be willing to do something as stupid as immortality. Have you ever had a single moment where you wanted it to last forever just to preserve that feeling for as long as you can? Natasha asked. Of course, Jessica answered yes to the question. She was thinking of the last Thanksgiving she had before her family died, although there was some small part of her nagging about some moments with Nat and Naruto. That's exactly what I'm trying to do. Natasha said with conviction. It may sound cliché, especially since it's coming from me, but Naruto is my forever, literally. She added. So, where am I supposed to fit in all this? Jessica asked. Wherever you want. Natasha replied plainly. With Naruto's unique condition, there is a high percentage chance that he will eventually practice polygamy. All I'm doing is dealing with it now, and at the same time making sure that it's at least someone who won't take advantage of him. She explained. He might look tough and all that, but deep inside, he's just a puppy. Are you expecting me to do the same as you? Jessica inquired, referring to Natasha's choice of immortality. No, but I got to say that I would like you to do it. I heard eternity can be pretty boring. Natasha answered half-jokingly. Nat had been driving for a while, and Jess noticed that they were on the freeway headed somewhere she was not expecting. Why are we headed to D.C.? Jessica asked. All this talk about the future reminded me that I need to file for three months of leave. Natasha said before turning back the subject. What are you going to do now? I'm not sure yet. I just need more time. Jessica confessed, causing a few moments of silence between the two. Stark Mansion, Malibu, Los Angeles. February 18th, 2009, 1900 H. Local. The Stark family just got home a few minutes ago. Pepper had already put Morgan to bed since she had a very active day, the same as any other day with Naruto. The couple themselves were exhausted as well, especially since Tony just got back from Afghanistan and was still severely jet-lagged. That was why Tony decided to heat up some leftovers while Pepper was putting Morgan to sleep. He couldn't wait to get some sleep, but it looked like it just wasn't meant to be. Don't bother heating that up. I brought some ramen. Tony suddenly heard Naruto say from the dining room. You should probably get some sleep soon. Naruto advised. I know. I know. Pepper already told me. Tony said, exasperated. He took a bowl and a pair of chopsticks from Naruto and sat on the chair. What are you doing here anyway? I thought you were going back to your girlfriend. He asked before noticing Pepper walking towards them silently, trying to making sure that Naruto would not detect her. I was. But my girlfriend and our roommate had some kind of misunderstanding. So I gave them some time to work things out. Naruto explained. I could also start answering some questions you guys wanted to ask. He said before placing another bowl of ramen on the table in front of an empty seat beside Tony. Ain't that right, Peps? I thought I could get by you this time. Pepper replied with a groan, a groan before sitting in the seat beside Tony. Thanks for the food, by the way. The trio ate in silence, just enjoying the meal. When they were done, Naruto just picked up the bowls before promptly making them disappear. This didn't surprise the couple anymore due to how many times that they had already seen Naruto do it, but that just reminded Pepper of her agenda. You already know what we want to know before officially hiring you, right? Pepper asked while emphasizing the word hiring. She knew how loaded Naruto was since she was the one who handled his portfolio, and that was just the assets that she knew about. Who knows what else Naruto owns? Yup. You want to know my real background, and what the Hell Shield is, right? Naruto asked to be sure. Pepper nodded her head while Tony was just sitting in one corner, trying to act disinterested. What do you want to know first? 
Let's start with what Shield is and why they're so interested in Tony. Pepper replied. She saw Naruto pull out a video camera and point it at Tony, which obviously earned curious stares from the couple. What are you doing? Tony asked. Oh. This. Just trying to record your reaction. It's going to be awesome. Naruto said with a grin. This obviously caused Tony to be a little disconcerted. So shield. A little disclaimer, though, I can only tell you what I know, and I can't tell you stuff that could immediately cause you both to either be incarcerated indefinitely or terminated. He added, which further increased Tony and Pepper's anxiety, but Naruto pushed forward with the topic. The Strategic Homeland, Intervention, Enforcement, and Logistics Division, or SHIELD is a US-based international spy agency, but you already, already know that. 40% of their funding comes from the US, 20% from private ventures, and the rest comes from the UN. Any questions about anything that I've said so far? Pepper shook herself no while Tony just stared straight towards Naruto. Shield is the derivative of the Strategic Scientific Reserve, or SSR. He continued before looking towards Tony. You know that one, right? Tony quickly ran through his memory, searching and compiling everything he had on the SSR. SSR was a top-secret advanced science division created to counter Nazi tech. Tony recited the essential details before stating the most significant and annoying fact. They were also the guys that helped the military finish Project Rebirth. Project Rebirth? Pepper interjected. It's the top secret project that created Captain America. Tony replied with a bit more resentment coming through than he wanted. He still hadn't gotten over his jealousy that his father put more importance in a dead guy from his past than his own son. He reeled his emotions back in before adopting his easygoing persona again. Some guy must have wanted their name to spell shield so bad. I feel sorry for the guy who had to come up with the name. He commented with a chuckle. Oh. You're definitely not going to like what I'm going to say next. Naruto retorted after hearing Tony's commentary. Tony's mind quickly understood what Naruto was implying, causing him to turn a shade paler and adopting a dubious expression. No. Just no. Tony said in denial. Pepper was seriously concerned with Tony's actions since she still hadn't figured out why he was acting this way. Good thing Naruto didn't make her wait long. Yup. Shield was co-founded by your dad, Howard Stark, and Cap's flame, Peggy Carter. Naruto blurted out, confirming Tony's suspicion, and Pepper finally understood Tony's sudden outburst. Hell, your dad provided most of the startup money that Peggy needed. He added. As for why they are so interested in you, Howard pushed forward a clause that you should not be introduced to the chaotic world that S.H.I.E.L.D. is situated in. Peggy also mandated that S.H.I.E.L.D. Would, would watch over you from the shadows, to make sure you didn't suddenly die, or at least that's what my girlfriend told me. Tony and Pepper sat in silence, absorbing what Naruto told them. The whole thing was so far-fetched, but based on everything they knew, it might just be real. Tony was still reeling from the revelation when Pepper remembered something. So, the surveillance outside the house when you first moved in? Yup. Shield the lot of them. Naruto replied. They're still trying to watch you guys. Though I made sure they would have as hard of a time as possible. What are they going to do now? Pepper asked. Nothing. They'll continue what they're doing. Naruto answered with a shrug. I know for a fact that they're already making contingency plans if something happened to Morgan. He added while pulling out a tablet and sliding it over to Pepper. Pepper was about to take it, but Tony grabbed it first. He unlocked it and quickly scrolled through the dozens of files with different scenario labels. Alien invasion? Zombie apocalypse? What the hell? Tony exclaimed. Oh yeah. Very real. 
They already have an alien on ice, and I already met a zombie. Naruto replied nonchalantly. The alien he was referring to was the blue guy that Fury tried to hide off the books. He only managed to find out about it after he accidentally heard Fury ask Coulson about Project Tahiti. As for the zombie, the impure world resurrection technique technically created those. What? Pepper shouted while simultaneously standing up. Tony would have mirrored Pepper's reaction if he wasn't frozen in shock. All the surprises end here. Who the hell are you? She exclaimed. Naruto internally snickered, thoroughly enjoying the pair's reaction. It was kind of comforting that he could still surprise surprise the couple and prank them even though he was telling them the truth. What do you want to know? Pepper pulled out her phone and opened a note file. She had been compiling questions she would ask Naruto if she ever had the chance, and now was as good a time as any. She already organized the list based on how important the question was. Who are you? We know your background story is all on paper only, and removing that, you don't exist anywhere. Pepper asked, going straight to the thing that has been bugging her the most. Unbeknownst to Tony, Pepper hired a team of private investigators to dig into Naruto's life, and all of them agreed on two things. Naruto was not a regular guy, and all his papers are fake. Tony just hung back, letting Pepper run the show. He recognized that she would be able to ask more pertinent questions. Well, the question should be what rather than who, but I guess I'll answer either way. Naruto mused before taking a deep breath. My name is Naruto Uzumaki, a former shinobi of the Hidden Leaf Village. My girlfriend has had the best description that I've ever heard. He started before pausing for dramatic effect. She called me an immortal dimension-hopping god. Pepper sat frozen in shock, not expecting such a far-fetched answer. Tony, on the other hand, decided to go the other direction and release a full-bellied laugh. Chapter 55 Dogfight Gulmira, Afghanistan May 28, 2009, 0700H Local What are we doing this time? Eric asked from atop a cliff, positioning himself as an overwatch. The Ten Rings are moving their forces inside Gulmira. They're going to make it their new forwarding base. Naruto replied through the comms on the other side of the village. I know someone from here, and we're going to do him a favor. As expected, Tony and Pepper were surprised by Naruto's revelation, causing them to forget temporarily about the shield talk. Being an alien god really does send anyone into an exist existential tailspin. After an hour of Naruto calming the couple down, he had been forced by Tony to do all kinds of tricks with Chakra, including walking up walls and making fires. Good thing Naruto had the forward thinking not to blurt out that he could call for the dead and the make anything he can imagine. The whole reveal finally convinced Pepper that Naruto was more than qualified to guard Morgan. His price to protect Morgan was a copy of Tony's armor and the base code for Jarvis's program. Who knows what he could come up with if he combines Wakandan tech and Tony's designs. Naruto decided to stay with the Starks for three days, giving Natasha and Jessica more than enough time to work things out. However, he was checking in on the location of the pair from time to time. That was why he was surprised when he sensed them going to Washington and staying there for a day. Before Naruto left, he planted an invisible Horatian tag on Morgan. He also gave her a 12-bead bracelet similar to the Wakandan Kamoyo beads. But this time, each bead was a fortified hinged clone placed into stasis. This effectively gave Morgan a 12-man bodyguard team. He conveniently left this detail out of Pepper and Tony's knowledge, though. When Naruto got back to New York, he was surprised to learn that Nat had already filed for leave so that Naruto could push forward with her operation. Naruto tried to subtly, well subtle for him, pry out what Nat's and Jess's disagreement had been about. But both of them immediately shuts up every time he tries to pry more on the topic. 
Naruto brought Nat and Jess to Switzerland to utilize the already existing equipment he used for Peggy's staging. He was only able to release a calming breath after the operation was finished. Natasha never felt so weak before, which caused her to panic a little. Good thing, Peggy was there to reassure her that it was normal. The group decided that Nat would stay with Peggy, Peggy for the duration of her three-month rehabilitation before she goes back to light duty. Jessica has no choice but to return to New York since she still has to go to uni. Naruto was snapped from his thoughts when something moving at high speeds got inside his default sensing range. He activated his shinigan before focusing on the incoming object. Motherfucker. Naruto said in a whisper. What's happening? Eric asked when he heard Naruto's exclamation through the comms. We're going to have a visitor. Don't shoot it or blow it up. Naruto replied. You're not going to tell me who or what it is. Eric said incredulously. You'll know when you see it. Was Naruto's short reply. He's here. Eric scanned the area through his high magnification spotting scope, trying to figure out where he is, but he didn't see anything. That was when he heard a faint whirring sound coming from the sky behind him. As soon as he turned around, he saw a red and gold streak flying towards the center of Gulmira, near where the rockets were. What the hell was that? Eric exclaimed while repositioning the scope to get a better look at the streak. Through his spotting scope, he could see that the blur was actually a red and gold armor. Damn, he finally finished it. Took him longer than I thought. Eric heard Naruto say through the comms. Of course you know the guy in the suit of armor. I mean, why wouldn't you? Eric commented exasperatedly, while still looking at the events unfolding below. The dude was doing everything, taking out terrorists, and blowing up the weapons cache and vehicles, leaving a mess behind. Are we even needed here? Guess not. Naruto replied. But we should stay here in case something unexpected happens. It was a good thing that fate decided not to throw Naruto another curveball since ten minutes later, the armor started flying out again after taking out a group of terrorists holding some civilians hostages and a tank who shot him down, down after his initial takeoff. The armor suit flew off to God knows were leaving a path of destruction in its wake. Seeing that there was nothing else for them to do, Eric started packing up the stuff, but not before sweeping his sights through Gulmira to make sure everything had been handled. He stopped in his tracks, though, when he heard Naruto behind him. The fucker is going to get himself killed. Naruto said before Eric turned around. Naruto pulled out his phone and dialed a number. Hey, Jarvis. Can you patch me through to Tony's suit? He asked. This was Eric's first concrete proof that there's someone inside that suit. Of course, sir. Patching you through now. Jarvis replied quickly. Naruto. Hey. I'm kinda busy driving right now. I'll call you back. Tony said quickly through the phone. Don't fuck with me, Tony. I just saw you blow up a tank. Naruto replied in an exasperated tone. What the hell? I just saw you at the gala before I left. Tony exclaimed. That's a clone. Does Pepper know about this? Naruto asked. Naruto knew that Tony left the gala, but he didn't keep track of him since Tony left with Happy. He thought he was just fed up with dealing with the press. The press had been trying for the past three months to get some scoop on the family. Even Congress can't get enough traction to force Tony to change his decision about holding the military contracts. Tony's in-death investigation of the books, through Jarvis's help, turned up some pretty interesting things, and he didn't like where it was going. Every bit of evidence that he uncovered points out that someone high up, like someone high enough to sit on the executive table, was manipulating the system. I liked it better when we didn't know about you. I could still counter how you found out stuff in front of Pepper. 
Tony retorted. Do you still want to know what I'm going to tell you? Just say it, man. It isn't easy to fly in a suit of armor. Well, it's about to get a whole lot harder. You just flew over a U.S. military restricted airspace. Expect some tales on you. Fuck. Was all Tony said before he cut off the comms. Well, that was rude. Naruto commented before pocketing his phone and turning his head back to Eric. You're going down there to sweep the main areas. Make sure nothing dangerous got left behind. What are you going to do? Eric asked while picking up his gear. I'm going to help the guy in the armor. He's about to get shot down by a squadron of F-22S. Naruto answered before picking up the excess gear left by Eric. Let's meet back here in three hours. He added before suddenly disappearing. What the hell is he going to do against four F-22S? Eric mused before running down the mountain to do what's left of his mission. Naruto, on the other hand, Hiroshine just under Tony's armor. He had to activate his flying ability to prevent himself from falling from the sky. Tony's radar must have been compromised when the tank shot Tony down. He knocked on Tony's chest plate to get Tony's attention. Tony was trying to reboot his evasive and detection systems while flying when he heard knocking on his armor. He looked down and saw something a lot crazier than his armor, Naruto flying just below him. The crazy part was he was flying just over Mach 1. His surprise caused him to tumble through the air before stabilizing himself again and hovering around 25,000 feet. You can fly. Of course, you can fly. Why wouldn't you? Tony sarcastically commented. We have no time for that. Naruto interjected. You have four F-22 incoming we have got to go now. He said before trying to reach Tony, but he suddenly stopped the second before his hand touched Tony's armor. Fuck. We're too late. They have visual. As soon as Naruto said that, he pushed Tony away from himself. Himself. Cuts started appearing across his skin, which alarmed Tony. Especially after strands started coming out of those cuts and started crawling over his skin, eventually covering his whole body. The strings weaved themselves together to look like some sort of fabric. In the end, Naruto looked like he was wearing a slightly bulky full body suit. He was also now wearing a dark orange helmet. Tony finally understood why Naruto was so obsessed with his armor design. Although Naruto's armor was a lot more streamlined than his own and had the ability to be deployed anywhere quickly, he could influence his Project Night plan based on Naruto's armor. He also made a mental note to ask Naruto about the metastatic stands that form his armor. Jarvis also managed to fix Tony's evasion system, but the radar was still offline. Stop daydreaming, Tony. Naruto said as he shook Tony's shoulder, snapping him out of his stupor. We need to take those planes down or at least break their line of sight, as well as the satellite surely aimed at us. Fly low and head for the mountain ranges when you get rid of your tail. Stay on radio contact. I'm on channel 43. He explained the plan. When the jets were finally a few kilometers away, the pair nodded to each other before separating. Creech Air Force Base, Nevada May 27, 2009, 2120H Local Rody was rushing towards mission control. Creech AFB was the primary base for operations conducted overseas. Being called down here instead of Edward's office meant something happened overseas. And since he was the Air Force's, Air Force's expert on advance and experimental planes, they found something they couldn't identify. As soon as he passed through the doors, Major Michael Allen immediately pulled him aside to brief him. Some people might wonder why a major could be disrespectful to a colonel, but there were some insinuating circumstances involved. Mainly because Rhodey primarily worked on the R&D, and Allen is on operations. At 19 45 H local, 
something showed up on the radar in Bagram. It was as fast as a commercial jet, and it was headed towards eastern Afghanistan. They first thought it was a system glitch since analysis showed that it was small, smaller than a car. But after rechecking, they determined that it was not a glitch. Major Allen explained. This information surprised Rhodey. He couldn't think of any object that fits into those parameters except for a slow rocket, but they would have already considered it. We lost it when it got below the mountain ranges. An hour later, it showed up again, and this time it flew through restricted airspace. The on-site officer decided that he wouldn't take any chances, and decided to scramble four raptors. They're going to have visual any minute now. That's where you come in. We need you to identify the aircraft. You got satellites overhead? Rhodey asked. We borrowed the satellite that the CIA was using over a rock. The problem is, it's an old model. The best we can do is track the objects that we're monitoring. But it's better than nothing. Allen replied. After Major Allen finished, the wing leader reported, his voice loud and clear over the speakers. This is Raptor 1. We just got visual on our HUD. Still too far for visual confirmation. The pilot reported. Do a flyby. Find out whatever the hell it is. Alan ordered. Sir. The satellite indicates we have two bogies, but they are too close to each other for the radar to confirm. An operator reported to Alan. Raptor 1. We have a reason to believe that there might be bogies. Bogies. Please confirm. Alan said to the comms. 10-4. The pilot replied, but something happened. Two signatures suddenly appeared on the radar. We got confirmation. Break 2. Break 2. The lead pilot ordered, causing the squadron to split up. Both attempts of radio contact failed. Permission to engage. Negative. Confirm visual contact first. Allen replied. Central Afghanistan. May 28, 2009, 0850 H local. Naruto was enjoying himself flying through the sky. He was still holding himself back a lot just to let the US's best fighter jet catch up. He made sure to create the illusion of rockets similar to what Tony had with his armor. This was to make them think that he used some form of external propulsion. Let's see how fast a raptor can go. Naruto whispered to himself before speeding up to Mach 2 and climbing to 50,000 feet. Tony, on the other hand, did the opposite. He dropped to 5,000 feet and opened up his air brakes, causing the jet to zoom past him. The low-altitude flight severely restricted the F-22's flight capabilities. He should know, he helped design the thing. But the pilots were better than he thought since they were on him again after a minute. They're good. Tony commented. How are you doing? He asked. Having fun. Naruto replied. Your planes can't turn. You should look into that. I wanted to fix that. They were just too cheap to pay for it. Tony retorted, still annoyed with the whole thing. Naruto laughed at Tony's statement before speaking. I'm going to spice things up a bit. Just warning you. Naruto then made a titanium steel alloy javelin and threw it towards the second raptor. Creech Air Force Base, Nevada. May 27, 2009, 2140H local. Bogey had just went supersonic. Engaging afterburners. The lead pilot reported. Still trying to get a visual. Raptor 3. Bogey B looks like a man, but I'm not sure. The pilot following the second object reported. The report gave Rhodey an idea, but he just could seem to zero in on it. Something almost hit Raptor 2. Permission to engage. 
The lead pilot shouted through the comms. Shit! Alan exclaimed. Permission granted. Amram launched. The pilot said. We got a hit. He reported after flying past the ball fire. Good work. Help out with the second bogey. Alan ordered, still looking at the aerial view of the area. Sir. We're still picking up a reading. The same operator reported. Raptor 1. The bogey is still in the air. I repeat. It's still in the air. Central Afghanistan. May 28, 2009, 0910 H local. Fucking hell. They're not playing around. Naruto exclaimed while shaking his head. He dropped to 40,000 feet since he didn't expect the strength of the explosion. What was that? Tony asked, still trying to evade the jets. They just used an AMROM on me. Took me by surprise. Naruto replied while trying to remove a creek and he didn't expect the strength of the explosion. What was that? Tony asked, still trying to evade the jets. They just used an AMROM on me. Took me by surprise. Naruto Naruto replied while trying to, re to remove a creek in his neck. How much are those planes again? I feel like I should not answer that question, but what the hell, it's not mine anyway. It's 150 million apiece. Tony answered. So 300 million, huh? That's cheap enough. Naruto mused to himself. Try to stay out of the airspace near me, Tony. Naruto followed the two raptors that just tried to shoot him down. It looked like they were trying to circle back towards his previous position. Creech Air Force Base, Nevada. May 27, 2009, 2147 H local. Rody pulled out his phone and dialed a number. After three rings, the other line finally answered, but there was a lot of background noise. Tony. Tony. Why is it so loud? Rody asked. I'm driving. What do you need? I just need to know if you have got some toys left behind in Afghanistan. Nothing. Why? Good. Cause I got two assholes that were going to blow to kingdom come. Rody said before closing the phone and focusing back on the comms. Something just landed behind me. Raptor 2 shouted. Go in front of me. I can't see you from here. I got a visual. A man is standing just behind your cockpit. Shake him off. Raptor 1 ordered. Fuck. I can't shake him off. Shit. What the hell is happening? Alan shouted. The guy just activated my ejector seat. Raptor 2 reported while slowly falling. His jet was not so lucky, though, since it crashed on the mountainside. This is Raptor 3. Bogey 2 is also a man. He's holding on to Raptor 4's belly. That's when Rody's phone started ringing again. It's me. Tony shouted. What? It's me in the suit, and the other one is Naruto. Central Afghanistan. May 28th. 2009-0920-H local. That was just awesome. Naruto said to himself before turning his head back towards the other plane that was headed straight towards him. Let's try this one. Katon, Garayaka no Jutsu. A fireball turned dragon launched out of Naruto's mouth and flew towards the F-22. The pilot tried to evade the fireball, but it just followed him around. After a few seconds, the pilot just bailed on his plane. Naruto then commanded the dragon to hit F-22, virtually engulfing it in a ball fire. This also caused all the ammo and armaments to explode. Damn. Probably too much chakra. Naruto commented with a sheepish look. 
Chapter 56 Meet the Parents Stark's Mansion, Malibu, Los Angeles May 27, 2008, 10.30 H Local Pepper rushed towards Tony's workshop slash garage. He had been missing ever since the firefighter gala, and she was worried that he got himself into trouble again. She pushed Naruto for information, but he kept his mouth shut. He just said that Tony was not dead. That's why when Jarvis informed Pepper that Tony had finally arrived and was holding himself up in the garage, she dropped everything in the office and ran back home. She barged through the door and ran down the stairs, although she was not expecting the scene in front of her. She entered the security code and walked inside. Tony? Pepper whispered in shock, pulling Tony's attention. Tony looked towards Pepper, while still suspended midair with metal contraptions on each limb, trying to remove the red and gold armor that he was wearing. He sputtered a few moments before giving up on defending himself. Be honest. We've done a whole lot worse than this. Tony deadpanned. Pepper's face immediately turned as red as her hair. She was about to reprimand Tony when she heard something that made the situation a whole lot worse. Um. I don't need to know what nasty things you do in your private time. Pepper heard from somewhere in the computer lab. She slowly turned her head towards the source of the voice and saw Naruto leaning back on a chair with his feet up on the table and eating ramen. Naruto. I didn't see you there. Pepper replied, trying to brush off her embarrassment. Obviously. Naruto said as he placed down the ramen bowl. We can forget everything that was said if you do me a favor. Oh, thank God, yes. Pepper replied, a lot more relaxed. What do you need? Well, one is for me, and one is for Tony, really, Naruto said sheepishly, which is immediately mirrored by Tony. This immediately sent warning bells up Pepper's mind. What did you two do this time? Pepper questioned, preparing herself for the inevitable headache. Oh. You really don't want to know. Naruto answered with a chuckle. He also noticed that after 25 minutes, Tony finally got out of his suit. Tony needs one F-22 with all the bells and whistles, and I need two of them. Just send them to Rody. What? Pepper exclaimed before turning towards Tony. Where the hell did you go? Afghanistan. Tony said quietly. He expected Pepper to blow up again, but she just stood there with her arms crossed while tapping her foot, urging him to continue. The Ten Rings somehow got three Jerichos, tanks, and a lot more stuff. They holed up in Gulmira, so I took my new suit and went there myself. And how did you get involved in this? Pepper asked Naruto, still using her mom look. I was there first. It's your husband's fault that he decided to take my job. Naruto retorted. If anything, you should thank me. Me. I just pulled Tony out of the crosshairs of 4F22. Hey. It's not my fault that a tank shot me down and banged up the hardware. Tony defended himself automatically, but Naruto's grin informed him that he just made the wrong move, and it wouldn't be long before he figured out why. You got shot down by a tank. When were you going to tell me this? Pepper exclaimed causing Tony to try to take a step back before stopping himself. He slowly walked towards Pepper, took her hands, and hugged her. Look, Pep. I'm okay. I'm not hurt though I can say that I'm shaken up by the fall. Tony whispered to Pepper. Pepper hugged Tony tighter. This was so she can subtly pat Tony's body for injuries and, at the same time, hide her teary eyes. When she was satisfied that Tony was indeed okay, she let go of him and wiped her eyes. I still don't know why you need three raptors. Pepper stated. Tony flew over restricted airspace, which is why the military tagged him. I was going to teleport us here, but they already had a visual on us, so we scrammed.
Naruto interjected before Tony could explain. Tony accidentally hit one of the planes. Me, not so much an accident, but more of a controlled explosion. He added while making a fire dragon appear in his hands, and making it dance around him just to emphasize his point. This fire show left Pepper and Tony a little dazed. Ever since Naruto revealed to the couple about his origins and skills, he had been using his skills more and more in private, and they still couldn't believe it. Although the pair had two wildly, wildly different reactions. Tony had tried to interrogate Naruto for how he does it, and what else can he do? His academic and scientific mind wouldn't allow him to rest until he figured out how Naruto did everything. The chakra explanation just wouldn't cut it. Tony even set a sub-protocol for Jarvis to record every unnatural thing Naruto did inside the house. Pepper, on the other hand, accepted the explanation a little more readily. Looking back at everything Naruto had done in the past, being an alien god just makes everything a little more acceptable, even though it would be a lot better if he just said he was some James Bond type of thing. There was just one thing she didn't expect, though. Placing house rules about things that probably no one had ever done before. No fireballs, no teleportation, no x-ray eyes, no lightning balls, no sharp objects, no water balls. Basically, no balls of any kind, and dragons too. Never forget the dragons. Of course, there were always exceptions to the rule. Like he can use his x-ray eyes and teleportation for emergencies. In the end, Pepper, with the help of Jarvis, was able to make a three-inch thick binder filled with comprehensive rules. Anyways, I have to meet my girlfriend. Naruto said before picking up his ramen bowl. I'll be back tomorrow afternoon. I want to watch Rodi's press conference tomorrow with you guys. He added with a small laugh before suddenly disappearing. Let me tell you something, Pep. I'm going to figure out how he does that. Tony declared. He already told you how he does it. Why can't you just take that answer? Pepper asked while cleaning up Tony's workspace. Because Chakra is not real. There's got to be another explanation. Tony insisted. Ugh. Just let it go, for now, Tony. Pepper reacted. Anyways, I contacted the wedding planner. She's coming on Saturday. Tony walked towards Pepper from behind and placed his arms ar around her waist. He gave an exploratory kiss to her neck and whispered. Good. I really don't want to extend this engagement period. It's so boring. I may have a way to pass the time. Pepper sexily replied before turning around and kissing Tony deeply. John, Switzerland. May 28, 2009, 0830 H Local. Thanks for bringing me. I really needed the break. Jessica said as soon as they arrived. She had already decided not to go in for the next two days, which was why she carried an overnight bag. I couldn't just leave you there. You've been studying too hard these last few months. You can say you took a long weekend in Switzerland. Naruto replied with a chuckle before giving Jess a peck on the lips, but she had other plans. She grabbed onto Naruto's face and kissed him deeper before he could pull back. When Naruto returned to the apartment in New York after Nat and Jess's misunderstanding, he was immediately pulled inside and forced into a weird conversation. By the end of the day, he was forced into something he didn't expect, an official relationship with another woman. Naruto still had no idea what transpired for both of them to pursue something so unorthodox for this world. He was reasonably sure there was an agreement between the two women. Still, his self-preservation instinct stopped him from asking. Although, if he was honest with himself, it felt a whole lot better to be romantic with both Nat and Jess rather than just with Nat. Ahem. The kissing couple heard from somewhere near the house entrance, which caused them to separate. The pair turned their head towards the door, and they saw a smiling Natasha leaning on the door frame. 
Enjoying yourselves? Jessica didn't even look a little sheepish. She just smiled sweetly while wiping her lips and sauntering towards Natasha and giving her a deep kiss of her own. Still jealous? Jessica asked with a sexy tone. Well, I'm still waiting on Naruto. Natasha answered, gesturing towards Naruto. Jessica turned around and saw what Natasha was referring to. Naruto was looking at the two of them with lust clearly visible in his expression. It's good to know we can still get that reaction out of him. Jessica commented. Natasha sauntered towards Naruto and gave him a kiss, which snapped Naruto out of his stupor. He shook his head before focusing back on Natasha. Where are we again? Naruto asked seriously. We're in John, Solnts. Natasha answered with a giggle. Okay. Naruto absent-mindedly replied before Natasha pulled him inside. How are you doing anyway? Naruto asked Natasha as soon as they got into the house. Jessica, on the other hand, immediately went upstairs. Presumably, towards Natasha's room to place her stuff away. Still not a hundred percent, but I'm getting there. Natasha replied, emphasizing her point by doing some light calisthenics. Already got my next mission from Fury. What are the parameters? Naruto asked. I have to go undercover for Hammer Industries. Fury believes that Justin Hammer has some shady deals. He wants me to look into it. I think there's more to it, though. Natasha explained. Come on. Don't leave me hanging. Naruto urged. Well. I think it's just something to put on my resume, for background purposes. He probably wants to put me inside Stark Industries somewhere in the future. Well, that's stupid. I can just put you inside the company any time without Stark and Pepper knowing. I'm still technically on the board of directors, you know. Naruto told Natasha. Just let Fury do what he wants. I get paid either way. Natasha replied. Right on time, too, since Jessica decided to walk down the stairs. Where's Peggy? Jessica asked Natasha. On her run. She should be back in maybe an hour or two. It's taking her longer to get tired. Natasha answered. The trio made the best of their alone time. They were telling stories, laughing, and a whole lot of other things. It took another two hours before the door opened. Peggy walked inside the house, only a little winded. Her typical exercise routine just doesn't work anymore, and it didn't sit well with her former military side. This train of thought distracted her enough not to notice the trio in the living room. Oh. Didn't know you guys were coming. Peggy said with her usual British accent. But this is perfect. Naruto, how do you exercise? I don't exercise. It does nothing for me. Naruto answered quickly. But I could give you some things to make your workout harder. Oh. That would be lovely. Peggy said, a lot more relieved compared a few seconds ago. Naruto stood up and retrieved something from behind him. He walked towards Peggy and handed over the item. As she took it, she saw that it was an ornate metallic bracelet. I'm not saying I don't appreciate the gift, but I don't typically wear jewelry. Peggy commented jokingly. This is an invention of mine. I call it the resistance band. Naruto proudly said, but it looked like the girls didn't appreciate his naming sense judging from the stifled laughter. Shut up. He mumbled towards his girls before bringing his attention back to Peggy. That band will make every movement harder. It can be anywhere from two times up to a hundred times. It will automatically adjust the level while absorbing the latent chakra that you're emanating to keep the effect up. Just keep it on at all times, even if you're just relaxing. This is perfect. Thank you.
Peggy replied gratefully before putting it on. She immediately felt the effect. It was like walk walking through water. I'll just clean myself up. She said before walking up the stairs to take a bath. Wow. You made a bracelet for her, huh? Natasha told Naruto with a contemplative tone. This caused Naruto to sweat involuntarily. I have one for you. Naruto quickly said. Hmm. Don't worry. I believe you. Stark Mansion, Malibu, Los Angeles. May 28, 2009, 1300 H Local. Knock, knock. Naruto shouted at the entrance. He usually would have just teleported right inside his room, but reckoned that he should at least go through the front door since he brought a guest. He made sure to tell Jarvis that it was a surprise, though. Are you sure it's okay for me to come? Jessica asked just slightly behind him, a bit of nervous energy coming off of her. The whole scenario feels surreal. It might be because Naruto teleported her just as she started taking a nap, or because of the massive mansion in front of her. Either way, she felt like she was being introduced to the parents. Yeah. No problem. We're just going to watch the news and maybe have some snacks before going back. Naruto answered confidently. It didn't take long for the front door to open, revealing Pepper in her stay-at-home clothes. She must have decided not to go in and just have a relaxation day. Naruto. Why are you using the front door? Pepper asked before noticing another person beside him. Well, hello there. She said while extending her hand towards the leather jacket-wearing woman beside Naruto. I'm Virginia Potts, but you can call me Pepper. Sorry for just showing up. Naruto didn't even wake me up before jumping. Jessica explained while holding on to Pepper's hand and shaking it. Before introducing herself. I'm Jessica Jones. Jessica for short. All of this was said with as much politeness as she can muster. Pepper just nodded with a smile, guessing that she was one of Naruto's girlfriends. Come on in. Tony and Morgan are already set up in the living room even though there's another hour before the press con. Pepper said before turning towards Naruto. I have no idea why you want to watch the press release about your mess though. Naruto nonchalantly walked straight inside the mansion with Jessica sticking closed behind him. We just want to see how Rodi will lie on live TV. Naruto answered while walking towards the living room. He immediately dashed towards Morgan the moment he saw her and carried her around, making her laugh. Hi, Morgan. How are you, princess? Naruto's antics just made her laugh harder, which also made Naruto laugh. While Naruto and Morgan are making each other laugh, Tony noticed Jessica at the living room entrance, standing uncomfortably. So he decided to make it worse. He stood up and walked over towards the unexpected guests. Hey, I'm Tony Stark, but you should know that. Billionaire, ex-playboy, genius, philanthropist, but you should know that since you're in my home. Tony said in the most Starkish way possible. Basically, just himself dialed to a hundred, and he was thoroughly enjoying the reaction that he was getting. And you are? Jessica took a minute to compose herself after the Tony Stark basically just harangued her. Still, Naruto's stories about the billionaire helped her calm down. Jessica Jones. I'm Naruto's girlfriend. Jessica replied. You mean one of Naruto's girlfriends? Tony retorted with a smile but Jessica just took that in stride. He checked her out up and down, which caused both Pepper and Jessica to raise their eyebrow. Wow. Look at you. Naruto must have been a god or something. Wait. He really is a god. Well, let's just say he's really lucky. He rambled, only to stop when he felt a hand on his shoulder. He turned around and saw Naruto still carrying Morgan. 
It's not like I appreciate you complimenting my girlfriend here, but you should stop before your engagement falls through. Naruto whispered while gesturing towards Pepper. Tony turned his head towards Pepper and saw her staring straight towards him while standing cross-armed. He then turned his head back towards Naruto. Help me. Tony whispered back in a desperate tone. Jessica slowly moved towards Pepper, trying to get away from the childish friends. Are they always like this? Jessica asked quietly. No. They're usually much worse, involving millions of dollars worth of damages, and a whole bottle of aspirin. Pepper replied before pulling Jessica towards the kitchen, leaving the friends in their impromptu skit. So tell me about yourself, Jessica. Jessica expected some form of questioning from the Starks when she figured out where Naruto took her, so she was able to formulate an answer even before she was even asked. There's nothing much to learn about me. I'm 23 years old and currently taking criminology. That's about it. Jessica replied, making sure to give only as little information as possible. Ha. Huh. Just like Naruto. You probably have some huge secrets, too, like being an immortal god or female super spy. Pepper nonchalantly commented. Jessica was taken off guard by Pepper's assertion. She expected the questioning. What she didn't expect was for Pepper to know a whole lot more than she thought. She was about to defend herself when a voice suddenly blared through the speakers, which surprised Jessica. Miss Potts. We have a guest Jarvis informed Pepper. Who is it? Pepper asked. Mr. Stane. 